Mr. Chair, council members and participants, we are now live. Good morning, everyone, and good morning, particularly to the members of the committee. This is a public hearing of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. Before we begin this hearing, I'd like to recognize Ms. Samantha Williams, Esquire, to read an important and necessary announcement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I understand that state law currently requires that the following announcement be made at the beginning of every remote public hearing as follows. Due to the current public health emergency, city council committees are currently meeting remotely. We are using Microsoft Teams to make these remote hearings possible. Instructions for how the public may view and offer public testimony at public hearings of council committees are included in the public hearing notices that are published in the Daily News, Inquirer, and Legal Intelligencer prior to the hearings and can also be found on phlcouncil.com. Everyone who has been invited to the meeting to testify should be aware that the public hearing is being recorded. Because this hearing is being recorded, uh, participants and viewers have no reasonable expectation of privacy. By continuing to be in this meeting, you are consenting to being recorded. Additionally, prior to Councilman Jones recognizing members for questions or comments they have for witnesses, I will note for the record at this time that the chat feature available in Microsoft Team is only to be used to allow members to signify that they wish to be recognized. In order to comply with the Sunshine Act, the chat feature must only be used for this purpose. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ms. Williams, and we will call the roll and will members say some words so that your image will appear on the screen. Council Member Dom. Good morning, Mr. Chair and colleagues. I am present. Council Member Gautier. Good morning, Mr. Chair, colleagues, and to all the witnesses present. Good morning. Council Member Gim. Council Member O. Good morning, Chair and colleagues. I'm present. Good morning. Vice Chairman Squilla. And Chairman Jones. I am present and a quorum has been established. Um, can we continue by reading the titles of the bills before us today? Bill number 220496, an ordinance authorizing the Commissioner of Public Property on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to grant Pico Energy Company an easement for the purpose of installing transmission lines across a portion of the parcel or parcels of land in an area bounded by 34th Street, Grace Ferry Avenue, and the Schuylkill River Pier Headline under certain terms and conditions. And bill number 220521, an ordinance authorizing the Chief Information Officer for the City of Philadelphia on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to enter into a professional services agreement for up to 60 months in order to obtain hosting and managed services for the one Philly HR benefits, payroll, time, and attendance system, all under certain terms and conditions. And bill number 220524, an ordinance authorizing the Commissioner of Public Property and the Director of Commerce on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to enter into a lease agreement with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania for property within the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's Interstate 95 right away between Spring Garden Street and Allegheny Avenue as well as certain portions of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's North Delaware Avenue right away between Spring Garden Street and Allegheny Avenue, and certain portion of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania's Richmond Street right away between Spring Garden and Allegheny Avenue, to be further subleased by the city to the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation, all under certain terms and conditions. And Bill number 220525, an ordinance authorizing the Commissioner of Public Property on behalf of the City of Philadelphia, to convey to the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania all or a portion of a parcel or parcels of land in an area bounded by Front Street, East Allen Street, Canal Street, and Laurel Street, all under certain terms and conditions. And Bill number 220522, an ordinance authorizing the Commissioner of Public Property on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to convey to the Philadelphia Authority of Industrial development, all or a portion of certain parcels of land in and about an area bounded by Wharton, 12th, Reed, and 11th Streets for further conveyance to enter into a sublease agreement with the Philadelphia Authority for Industrial Development for use by the City of Philadelphia of a premises located 
at 1357 South 12th Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and to acquire fee simple title or a lesser real estate interest by purchase, condemnation, or otherwise in a portion of certain parcels of land in and about the area bounded by Wharton, 12th, Reed, and 11th Street, all under certain terms and conditions, and Bill number 220322, an ordinance amending Chapter 16400 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Surplus Properties by adding criteria for evaluating non-competitive dispositions, all under certain terms and conditions. And uh, Council Member Jones, bills number 220507, 220289, and 220290 are being held at the request of the bill's sponsors. Thank you so very much, Ms. Williams. Do any of the members of the committee have any opening remarks on any of the bills uh, aforementioned? Seeing none, can we Mr. Now? Chair? Yes. I was hopeful to make opening remarks when my bill is actually up. Is that okay? Uh, you can choose to do so now, oh, okay. or you can do, choose to do so later, or you can choose to do both. I would like to do so later. I just wanted to make sure I was not losing my opportunity. <laughs> you, you got it. All right. Uh, with that in mind, um, can you read Ms. Williams, the panel of the first witnesses to testify? Please call them in order of their testimony. Sure. We're going to start with bill number 220496. And the first witness is Susan Buck. Ms. Buck, are you connected? Ms. Yes, Buck? I am. Yes, I am, okay. Councilman. Good morning, Very everyone. Good. State your name for the record and please begin your testimony. My name is Susan Buck. I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Parks and Recreation. Good please afternoon. Mm -hmm. good, good morning, Chairperson Jones and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. My name is Sue Buck, and I'm the Deputy Commissioner of Operations for the Department of Parks and Recreation. I'm here today to testify in support of Bill Number 220496, an ordinance authorizing the Committee of Public Property on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to grant Pico Energy Company an easement for the purpose of installing transmission lines across a portion of the parcel or parcels of land in the area bounded by 34th Street, Grace Ferry Avenue, and the Schuylkill River Pier Head Line under certain terms and conditions. The approval of this ordinance will allow for an amended, amendment to an existing easement. The amendment will add approximately 38,000 square feet of overhead easement area permitting PICO to configure an existing transmission line, which extends over the Schuylkill River. The reconfiguration of this line will allow PICO to enhance the capacity and reliability of their electrical service to University City. This proposal will not have any effect on the Schuylkill River Trail. In exchange, exchange for this additional area, the city will be compensated for the appraised value of the additional easement area in the amount of $23,500. The Department of Parks and Recreation supports this measure and accordingly, I respectfully request that City Council approve bill number 220496. I'm also requesting a suspension of the rules so as to allow for the first reading at the next session of Council. I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Are there any questions for Ms. Buck? Seeing none, thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, and can we call the next bill and are there any other witnesses on this bill, Ms. Williams? No other witnesses for this bill. Uh, we can move now to bill number 220521. And the first and only witness for that bill is Mark Wheeler. Mr. Wheeler, are you connected? Mr. Wheeler? Yes, I am, uh, Councilmember Jones. I'm here. Okay, thank you. State your name for the record and please begin your testimony.
Mr. Wheeler? Are you on mute? I think Mr. Wheeler might be frozen. Yes. Uh, can you hear? Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, good morning, Chair Joe. We're having a little uh, trouble. Public Works, coming I'm in. Mark Wheeler. Let's see. I apologize for that. Quite all right. See if this will improve the situation. Uh, joining me today is uh, Prachi Sati, uh, One Philly Director. I'm pleased to appear before the committee today to support Bill number 220521, which would authorize the Office of Information and Technology to enter into a multi-year agreement up to 60 months in order to obtain hosting and manage services for the One Philly HR benefits payroll time and attendance system. A multi-year agreement will lower the total cost of the new contract with an industry-leading hosting and managed service provider versus contracting with the same provider for only one year with annual recurring renewals. Uh, with a multi-year contract, a vendor is more likely to make increased investments uh, that will lead to better services at lower costs. Implementing this contract will include a transition of the system to a new and more stable, secure, and future-focused cloud infrastructure platform. The contract also strengthens the city's ability to hold the vendor accountable for performance when resolving in issues. Uh, I respectfully ask the committee that the rules of council be suspended to allow this bill to be reported out of the committee to have its first reading at the next session of council. Uh, Prachi and I now stand available to answer any questions uh, presented by the committee. Thank you. Um, we don't have uh, member Thomas on this call. Some of the issues that he raised early on in the budget, are they a part of the fix here? Uh, no, Chair Jones. Uh, this is a transition of the system from one uh, cloud structured environment and support managed service pro contract provider to another. Uh, we do expect that with that transition, will have even better capabilities to work with and hold the, the contractor accountable for the system. But there are no application changes or feature changes to be made. Um, and I should say we did have a conversation with council member uh, Thomas and his staff uh, last month and addressed uh, many of the questions that he had about the this move, the benefits, and then any issues uh, with the performance of One Philly also. Would you classify that conversation as satisfactory to the member that he it resolved some of his concerns i would yes uh chair Jones. Because, okay because i'm not uh, you know i i just know it was a a very public and personal impact to him which not not only impacted him personally but highlighted some of the concerns uh system-wide so this solution is a hardware solution, not a operational solution, or we're just changing the, operational. the server? We're changing the hardware and how the hardware uh, is managed on our behalf and where the hardware sits uh, in the cloud uh, and okay. our access to make changes to the, to the system as well. Okay. Any members of the committee have any further questions? Hearing none, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Ms. Williams, next bill. We can move on to bill number 220524. And the only witness for that bill is Ann Nadal. Ms. Nadal, welcome. Are you? Good are morning, you Chairman. Good morning, Chairman right. Jones and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. My name is Ann Nadal, the Director of Commerce, and I'm here to testify in support of Bill 220524, which authorizes the Commissioner of Public Property and the Director of Commerce on behalf of the city to lease with the Commonwealth for property within the I-95 right-of-way. 
The city intends to sublease with the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation, a nonprofit corporation with a mission to design, develop, program, and maintain public amenities along the central Delaware River waterfront. The portion of I-95 in the Northern Liberties, Fishtown, and Port Richmond's neighborhood. Port Richmond neighborhoods is built on structure, creating areas of open space underneath the highway. To transform this open space into a community asset, areas are programmed to include landscaping and stormwater management where feasible and the continuation of a waterfront trail. This development will create additional public space that is usable and accessible and provide greater amenities to the local communities. There are also future opportunities for parking, However, to ensure these remain high quality public spaces, the city and state need support from the Delaware River Waterfront Corporation on maintenance. This lease agreement enables the city, state and DRWC to work together on providing and maintaining the spaces under the highway, ultimately improving connections between the neighborhoods and the waterfront. The Department of Public Property and the Department of Commerce support this measure, and we respectfully ask the council approve this bill and suspend the rules to allow first reading at the next session of council. Thank you for the opportunity to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Yes, uh, just a few. How big a parcel are we talking about? And from where on the lower end to the upper end are we talking? Okay. I'm going to ask if, if it's okay with you, uh, Chair Jones, I'm going to ask Tom Forkin and Liz Lankinaw uh, to join to answer these specific questions. Elizabeth is on and I know Joe is, is in the crowd. Okay, please state your name and provide a response. Sure. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Lankenau. I'm the Director of Infrastructure Program Coordination in the Office of Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability. I would have to check on the exact acreage because some of the highway is on fill, so you can't pass under it, and some is on structure, so there's it's intermittent. Uh, but these areas do fall between Spring, uh, Spring Garden Street and Allegheny Avenue. That's the, that's close. So is it how wide a path? And you don't have to be exact. I just, I'm trying to put my mind around what we are improving and what what impact will it have to walkability. Point of information, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes, recognizes um, Vice Chair Squilla. Thank, thank it, that's thank you. That's your district, isn't it? Yes, yes. Okay, um, thank you. So um, we have something similar to this. Um, it's called ILMAC. It's a, a organization under that that maintains and facilitates uh, under ninety five from the Walt Whitman Bridge to the Ben Franklin Bridge. And what they do is they have the ability to maybe lease or or use under that area, and therefore then has the resources and the maintenance ability to go in there, maintain it with lighting, with landscaping and all those other things that are important to the surrounding community so that if it does become a blight, we have somebody to go to. Um, nothing against PennDOT or, or anybody else, but when they deal with these small little projects in and around the community, we need somebody we could go to that's nimble enough to get a quick a fix as quick as possible. So that that is the, the goal of this moving forward. But on the northern end, under the new construction of, of this, and hopefully it'll create the same type of... Um, stewardship that we have on the southern end. Under That's very insightful. Was the negative impact. That is, um, that is a good, we have a twin on the Schuylkill River Trail where we try to maintain. So I understand clearly how without that kind of go-to person to hold accountable, it can get away from you real quick. So I'm glad to hear that we're going to have more walkability along that trail. Um, are there any other questions uh, from members? Hearing none. Are there any other witnesses to testify on this bill? Not for this bill. Um, we can move on to bill number 220525. And the only witness for that bill is Elizabeth Lankinall. So uh, Lankinall, are you there? I am here. Hello. Uh, Elizabeth Lankenau, Director of Infrastructure Program Coordination, Office of the uh, Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability. Good morning, Chairman Pers Chairperson Jones and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. My name is Elizabeth Lankenau, and I am the Director of Infrastructure Program Coordination at the Office of Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability. 
I am here today to testify in support of Bill Number 220525, an ordinance authorizing the Commissioner of Public Property on behalf of the City of Philadelphia to allow the Pennsylvania Department of Transportation to purchase in fee simple a parcel of land at 12 to 28 East Allen Street under certain terms and conditions. PennDOT intends to purchase this land for its limited access right of way, which is needed for construction, staging, and placement of new bridge support structures. The site is located within a residential and commercial area of Fishtown. However, its vertical development is encumbered by an I-95 overpass. The Department of Public Property and the Office of Transportation Infrastructure and Sustainability support this measure, and accordingly, I respectfully ask that City Council approve Bill Number 220525. I am requesting a suspension of the rules so as to allow for first reading at the next session of Council. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. How how well are we working with our state? and federal counterparts to get matching dollars for programs like this? I've heard you mention the Commonwealth. Yes, uh, so when I came to work at Otis, my primary function was to be that liaison between the city and state on the I-95 project. We get a lot of benefits out of this. It's a disruptive project and we are pretty lucky with the PennDOT team that we have. They understand the damage that the highway going in in the first place caused to the city of Philadelphia. And so when they are in there, we're getting uh, a lot of things constructed like bike trails, um, you know, the, the amenities under the highway, they're putting in, you know, special landscaping, uh, special hardscaping that they might not otherwise understanding that this is going through an urban area, you know, people live next to this. So uh, there's a lot, a lot of extras we do get out of this project. And that's my I'm glad job. to I'm glad to hear that. And is that a precursor to what we're going to kind of tag team that infrastructure money coming down the pike? For that's right. Similar? That's right. There is an, uh, for example, uh, there is an application going in for another phase in the Girard Avenue area, the northbound southbound lanes that PennDOT will be applying for funding, and that is funding that will again help make improvements to the street network leading up to the highway. That's just one example. The I-95 CAP project, the Penn's Landing Park, which we'll hear on Monday, it's another great example. Um, so, yes. So I'm always glad to hear good things going on in the first uh, councilmatic district. Always a pleasure to hear those improvements. But I'd like you to give a little attention to the school kill side, we have some challenges by way of traffic overgrowth uh, and look to at least establishing some feasibility money to do feasibility studies to talk about other crossways across the school kill to ease some of the, the concerns about traffic, the concerns about parking, and to see how we can kind of take stranded assets at this point because we don't have solutions to come up with useful ways to incorporate land masses on that side of the river too. Absolutely, I would be happy to speak with your office about some examples that you can give and then be in touch with PennDOT about how to make those improvements. Appreciate you much. Are there any other questions for the witness? Seeing none, thank you for your testimony. Ms. Thank Williams. you. Uh, we can move on to bill number 220522, and the first two witnesses for this bill are Ann Fadulin and Thomas Dalfo. Welcome. Is everyone connected, Ms. Fadulin? I am here. All right. State I your name well. for the record. You are sure. as well. State mm -hmm. your name for the record, and please begin your testimony. All right. Uh, good morning, Chairperson Jones and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. My name is Ann Fadulin, and I'm the Deputy Mayor of Planning and Development for the City of Philadelphia. I'm here to testify in favor of Bill Number 220522, authorizing the city to convey to the Philadelphia Authority for Industrial Development, also known as PAID, certain parcels of land for further conveyance. The parcels the city proposes to convey cover a large portion of a square block between 11th and 12th Streets and between Wharton and Reed Streets. Portions of this parcel will be conveyed while some will remain in city ownership. 
In the fall of 2018, the city issued an RFP for the redevelopment of this property. After a competitive process that produced multiple proposals, the selection team chose Altera Property Group to redevelop this parcel into a mixed use development. Members of the community, the district council member staff, and various employees of the city and paid participated on the selection committee. In addition to this project providing some much needed affordable housing, the city will collect future tax revenue and create both temporary and permanent jobs. The community will receive 40 parking spots in the lot across the street from this property uh, accessed on Reed Street. And the city will also receive a new and modern fire station as well as cash consideration for the disposition of the property. The purchase price was based on appraisals. The administration, including the Philadelphia Fire Department, fully supports this project. Accordingly, I respectfully ask that City Council approve Bill Number 220522, and I am requesting a suspension of the rules so as to allow for the first reading at the next session of Council. Thank you, and I will be happy to answer any questions you may have. We're going to hold questions until the second panelist uh, gives their testimony. Um, please. Please begin your testimony. Sure. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairperson Jones and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. My name is Thomas Dalfo. I'm a Senior Vice President for Real Estate Services at PIDC, and I'm here to testify in favor of Bill Number 220522. Um, and I'm going to talk about the process that we went through for this. PIDC managed a public competitive developer selection process for the property that, that Ms. Fadulin referenced. Um, we issued the request for proposals on October 17, 2018, and in response to um, responses to the RFP were due on January 18, 2019, which was a date that was pushed back one month to accommodate community um, input that the Past Young Square Civic Association was gathering um, to inform the process. At the community's request, PIDC and the city also modified the development requirements for the project to include an affordable housing component, which has been, um, which is part of the development program for the project going forward. Uh, three responses to the RFP were received. Two firms were invited to make presentations to the city selection committee in April of 2019. The selection committee um, selected Altera Property Group, um, and among the criteria that were considered was the consistency of the proposed development program with the City Planning Commission 2035 plan for this portion of the city. Throughout the RFP process, there was extensive communication with the surrounding community, including a number of community meetings, both in person prior to the pandemic and virtual since that time. <clears throat> PIDC presented to the Pass Young Square Civic Association on November 6, 2018, again on December 16, 2019, and then virtually on both July 20th and October 14th, 2021. Uh, there was also a site tour that was held during the RFP process and community members were invited and did participate in that process in November of 2018. Um, the selection committee um, also included a member from the Pass Young Square Civic Association uh, to review the proposals. In addition, three members of the, the Pass Young Square Civic Association also participated in the developer interviews of the two finalists that had been uh, considered for the site. Um, and I would note that the duration and the, um, the depth of coordination with the community for this site was extraordinarily extensive uh, and more than we've done in, in projects in the past. It really serves as what I would say as a poster child for a model for PIDC to follow going forward. And we've, we've started to do that already in, in some additional properties we're, we're marketing on the city's behalf. So I would thank you for the opportunity to testify and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. So, so let me get this right, Member Squilla. In your community benefits agreement, you not only negotiated affordable housing, but a brand new fire station? Oh, that no, is, say that on the record. That is that correct. That is absolutely correct. And, plus, um, uh, plus a consideration for the property itself. And, 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 and we were but, able, able to retain the fleet building property and not demolish it to be reused as a uh, repurposed uh, on that parcel. Uh, I just want to say one thing, uh, Mr. Chair, also is that 
Uh, this process has been a long time, but it, it really is something that I want to try to use as a model moving forward for a lot of our RFPs that go out there. Uh, the community being part of the RFP process, having their input, again, not everybody agrees on every part of this development and they never will. Um, you know, we got complaints during it. It's it's too much density. It's not enough density. It's too much parking. It's not enough parking. You know, we we went through this whole gyrations of many meetings and the it's a lot of pressure on the community group, though. It's a lot of pressure on them because as they're a part of this process, they have to answer the questions that normally, you know, I gave up my seat to have the community represent on that seat. So a lot of the questions have to be answered by the community and they're a volunteer group. It takes a lot of time and hours and I want to really thank Pashong Square Civic Association who was a part of this process and uh, you'll hear them testifying uh, later on. Um, but, you know, it also goes to though the ability of the city to work in partnership with the community as we're building this out. Adding affordability to the project on a private developer base is sometimes not the easiest thing, but having the leverage of working with the city and the value of the property and also being able to get a brand new firehouse out of it um, again, was a win-win a for everybody, uh, for most people. There's still, like I said, there's still some folks that aren't happy with the, the final outcome and, you know, some folks that believe that, you know, during our 2035 plan and study, things have changed in the community, so maybe we should relook at things. Um, but at, overall, the process has been something that I'm really proud of and I, I'm really excited to hopefully produce again in the future working with PIDC in the city. So, Thank you, and I want to thank Tom and Ann and Bridget and all the people who are working with this. Um, again, there's miscommunication sometimes through these processes, but having all these meetings and doing in-person, virtual, um, it was a long haul getting through COVID and everything, but I think we're at finally at a point where, you know, we're happy to move forward. Well, anytime you want to lend a hand in the 4th District to negotiate community benefits agreement, you are welcome at our table. All right. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions from members? Are there any other witnesses to testify on this bill? Uh, the Ms. next Williams? panel is Mark Cartella. Mr. Cartella, are you connected? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Cartella. Uh, I am the VP of Development and Construction at Altera Property, Property Group. And thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee members for allowing me to share uh, our testimony to support this important bill, 220522. Um, I will save all uh, our uh, accounting of the history because I think the previous testimonies were extremely comprehensive and detailed. So for time's sake, I, I will skip through that portion of my testimony I was planning to share. Um, needless to say, the level of community engagement and collaboration has, has been nothing short of, of robust and extensive. I'd like to point out a few things, uh, important design uh, features of the project that have been um, produced as a result of hearing feedback from the community, as well as our partners in the city. And that includes, but is not limited to, a reduction of unit count from 170 to 155 units. An introduction of mixed income with 20% affordable units now being part of the property, as you've just heard. Um, an enhanced traffic study that was produced um, in consideration of ride sharing and, and commercial parcel deliveries, an enhanced la landscaping package, and revised architectural features incorporating more masonry to better adhere to the neighborhood's existing character and charm. Uh, Altera has made an un unwavering commitment to the, to the public process and community engagement, accommodated to the community's input regarding both needs and preferences, and remain committed the ongoing inclusion of community stakeholders throughout the project's development cycle. In closing, Altera is extremely grateful to be part of this critical project. We're very proud of the work that's been accomplished thus far and look forward to continuing the redevelopment process for both the city and the community. We strongly feel this redevelopment process is a model that can and should be replicated in other parts of our city, as Councilman Squilla just alluded to. Many thanks to the, council, to, to the Councilman, his office for their leadership, planning for their vision, PIDC for their administration, public property for their collaboration, and of course, the Passion Civic Association for their continued engagement and input resulting in a better project. Thank you. Thank you so much. All I'll say is in a lot of um, our negotiations, we're glad if we can get some um, lighting 
and some parking and some uh, some area for green space. Can, may I be so intrusive as to ask what the total project development cost is? Sir, uh, yes, it, it is. Um, well, if, if you know, I, I may. I, I'm going to take you off the hook. Don't ask. <laughs> I could just I, tell you're building fire stations. This is a big, this is a big project. It, it's a multi-phase, large, uh, multi-million dollar project. All right. Thank you for that. Um, are there any questions for this panel? Council member, council chair. Yes. Member Mark Squillow. Thank you. Um, quick question, Mark, and I know this process has been long, but I mean, what we want to hear still is that, you know, at, at the sale goes through, everything moves forward, apply for building permits. We still would like to see a coordination and collaboration with the Civic Association for, you know, possible things that are going on in the future. And um, and I know you have committed that uh, uh, with the uh, Passchot Square Civic Association. I just want for the record to see like even during construction, how will there be anybody who will be direct contact with the community? Will there be a liaison or anything like that that we could work with? Absolutely, Councilman. Yes, um, we, we've said that very publicly and we meant uh, what we said when we said it. Um, Sarah Anton has been phenomenal to work with that leads up the Passion Square Civic Association. Um, and that, that dialogue and coordination and collaboration will continue throughout the life cycle of the project through groundbreaking construction and completion. Okay, that's just important too, as we move forward to continue that. Sometimes think people think that even after you pull permits that the uh, there's no other work that needs to be done. This needs to be done all the way through. And I appreciate your willingness to do that because it makes it a lot easier for us as, as also council members that we don't have to be in the middle as things go wrong and, and things aren't are seen on the street that they could have a direct access and contact. Uh, to you and a development team. Thank you, Councilman. And just for the record, I will be the point of contact. That's even better. Thank you so much. Well done, Member Squilla. Well done. Are there any other questions from members of the committee? Seeing none, Ms. Williams. Council member, we can uh, move on to bill number 220322. Um, and I believe. Um, that council member Gautier had wanted to make opening remarks. Outstanding. All right, member Gautier, um, you, you are recognized on this important piece of legislation. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and good morning, everyone. Um, thank you to all of my colleagues on uh, the Public Property Committee for the opportunity to be recognized on Bill 220322. This legislation proposes a change to the city's non-competitive vacant land disposition policy to help address the affordable land crisis affecting our city. Rapidly spiking market forces are making an already bad affordable housing and affordable food landscape even worse. But by passing legislation that creates a pathway for community-led organizations to acquire permanently affordable land, we can help to address these issues. Bill 220322 proposes that applications to acquire land from the city submitted by community land trust and other community ownership structures will receive additional scoring in the non-competitive disposition process and would allow organizations that qualify as CLTs to enter into one to five year leases with the city to allow time for permitting and fundraising to eventually purchase the land outright. Given the state of our local affordability crisis, the city's thousands of vacant parcels offer a unique and important opportunity to secure land uses that our communities need and can benefit from the most. Community ownership models like community land trusts result in equitable development because the community sets the rules for how the land is used and ensures any future development continues to benefit residents. Their decision-making structure ensures that a community-run board retains ownership of the lands, which gives the community a direct stake in the future of their own neighborhoods. City support for these types of groups is not a new idea. 
Los Angeles and Chicago currently leave the management and stewardship of their affordable housing units to CLTs. And several states have set aside funds to help CLTs acquire municipality-owned property. The disposition policy edits you will hear about this morning would also include and benefit other groups, such as CDCs, that partner with land trust on disposition applications to acquire property. I'd like to take a moment here to be clear about what this bill does and does not do. This bill does not change the competitive disposition process or how the city is currently posting RFPs for minority developers and affordable home ownership on its vacant land. It does not change any of the other ways someone can apply to develop city vacant land through non-competitive disposition. An application that is viable today would still be viable under the terms of this bill. It does not compel the land bank to automatically grant leases or dispositions. The agency and city council always retains their right to not select an applicant or keep a property um, unavailable. It does not come with hundreds of parcels automatically granted to community groups. And lastly, the bill does not change the district council member's role in the land disposition process. All multi-year leases and dispositions require council action and the land agencies work very closely with council to ensure their priorities are informing this work. What the bill does aim to do is reduce the barriers of entry for grassroots community organizations. It gives residents of changing neighborhoods more of a chance to be considered, to have more of an ownership stake in publicly owned property, and provides the time and space in fast-paced markets for community members to fully develop projects that will be beneficial to them and their neighbors, all elements that should be prioritized with the land owned by our taxpayers. I'd like to thank the legislation's co-sponsors. Their input very much helped improve the bill. I'd also like to thank the administration for their collaboration on the amended version of this bill that you will see here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, member, um, for this important piece of legislation to be considered today. Um, some, I had an opportunity to talk with you briefly about some of the uh, nuances of the bill, uh, and I'd like to put some of them on the record in the sense that you said each of those agreements could the term, the length, be negotiated per parcel on an individual basis? Is that correct? That is correct. And so, you know. Um, it just gives the it, option to go up um, one to five years, yes. Yeah, that's an important distinction. Um, also, uh, there there is room for joint ventures with public-private partnerships uh, yes. that can be recruited around the site acquisition of a particular piece of land. Yes. And the third, and as more and as important, the district council person gets to sign off on any said agreement to make sure it's right for their individual district. Absolutely. As um, is the case today, there is no long-term lease and no um, land disposition that will be able to move forward without legislation from the district council member. Fine. Are there any uh, questions of other members of the uh, committee? Seeing none, can we bring the first panel to testify on this bill? The first witness on this bill is Ann Fadulin. Ms. Fadulin. Good morning, morning again. again. Yeah. Good morning. Uh, good morning, uh, Council Member Jones and other members of the Public uh, Property and Public Works Committee and members of City Council. I am Ann Fadulin, Deputy Mayor for the Department of Planning Development, and I'm here to present testimony on behalf of, of the administration on Bill Number 220322, which provides a preference for community organizations who are pursuing the development of permanent affordable housing or green space on publicly owned land. Further, the bill provides for an extended lease term of up to five years for community organizations to garner neighborhood input and secure project financing. Uh, and also this bill adds some uh, additional notice provisions to the community uh, in the case of, of, of disposition actions. The administration shares the sponsor's commitment to affordable housing and food access uses on public land. 
Further, we understand that it is important to allow time for community voices to be heard and for organizations to be provided with the time needed to secure project financing. It is important to note that good custodial care must be taken of vacant land and so until such time as it can be put back into productive use. Therefore, it is imperative that until such time as these community groups are able to pursue full disposition of public land, the community organizations must provide insurance and show proof of funds to be able to maintain the properties in good order for the entire lease term. Further, no development of any type of structure can take place on the land during the lease term. Once the community organization secures the funding to develop the land, the appropriate path is to then pursue full disposition. Thank you for the opportunity to pre present this testimony. I will be happy to answer any questions uh, any members of the panel may have. Thank you. Yes, very quickly, Ms. Fadula, thank you for your testimony. This doesn't deviate much from what we used to do for individual properties under the Vacant Property Review Committee. We would offer a license agreement for a period of time to allow for development. And if at such time that development happened, that's wonderful, there would be a deed restriction so that they could not transfer it for speculators' profitability. But also, if they could not find a way to path to development, it would revert back to the city. Is this similar in that nature? So it is very similar to both a license agreement and, and to some extent, um, a reservation letter. It's probably more similar to a license agreement. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's not necessarily a deed restriction because it's not being fully transferred with a deed transfer. It's a lease agreement. And yes, under the terms of the lease agreement, if they were not, a, if the community organization was not able to uh, come up with project financing, or, you know, or decided they're not going to pursue the development anymore, uh, the lease would be terminated and the property would come back into, uh, it would still be in inventory of the land holding agency, but in this day, it would come back as then available land. Thank you so very much. Yes, sure. yes, Ms. Good would like to add in that another important distinction is that um, this pathway would prioritize organizations that can demonstrate um, at least 51% um, community ownership and um, that can demonstrate they wish to use the land for a community beneficial project, including um, permanently affordable housing, um, community facilities, or urban gardens. So those those uses are prioritized or restricted to? In this pathway, um, uh, the, those, the uses are restricted to the three that I mentioned. However, anybody can still, will still be able to apply um, under the non-competitive process for other uses. That's very clear. Thank you so very much. Any other questions for this? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a uh, Councilman Squilla. Member Squilla. Yes. Um, when we first did the land bank and we were building out the land bank, we had a lot of support, obviously, from the Community Land Trust, and we all supported that because the disposition of land was so confusing and it was so complicated. We wanted to streamline it and, and do the land bank. Um, we VPRC was a, a hindrance in that it was an, another obstacle in, in being able to dispose of properties. When we put these properties in a, in a hold into the land trusts, they go in anywhere from one to three years. And I understand that it's up to the council member to introduce a, a resolution to do that. Uh, I mean, three to one to five years, I'm sorry. Um, do you see that? I mean, wouldn't this slow the process down of being able to do affordable development? So not necessarily, right? This is, this is um, so a, as um, we spoke about, right? To some extent, there's something very similar to this already available under the existing legislation, right? These, um, these types of uses can already come in non-competitive. Um, they can already uh, get a lease term of up to five years to allow time to, uh, you know, as we said, get input or, or gather financing because Council, I mean, as you know, it takes a long time to get financing together, particularly for, for a tax credit project, and it takes some time. 
And this really would um, kind of set aside these properties in order to allow time to pursue that financing or to garner uh, city input. So, uh, excuse me, community input. Um, so, for example, we've already got a couple of these leases in place. There's something already in place with with ASE that they, um, I think they have upwards of 100 properties that are kind of in a lease agreement uh, for them to try to figure out some different uses that they're looking at. I believe there's also a lease agreement in place with the Community Justice uh, Land Trust as well. I think the difference with this legislation is that um, under the situation where I don't know, let's say somebody applies for the property because they're going to create, um, you know, market rate housing, uh, uh, at, uh, but it's going to be have some affordability at 120 percent of median. And then someone uh, also applies for this property that's a, a land trust or qualifies under this legislation and wants to do permanent affordable housing. Um, that the land bank would essentially look at, or the land management agencies, excuse me, would look at the application from the land trust and the deeper affordability uh, prior to the other application. Uh, but and that's if what, the land trust application was qualified, then it would go that direction. Right, that's what I understand, because I, I work with land trust in my district. We've done these projects, right? We, we put properties on hold and, and went through it, you know, with WCRP and some other folks and, you know, did uh, great jobs. They do take long, but we already do that. I, I'm trying to understand why we would codify this in, in some special language that doesn't give us the ability to, to work with, all, with our community land trust partners on all these projects we work so well with. I would just... But, Put out there that in practice, we are recognized as member oh. All right, sorry, thank you. I would put out there that in practice, um, even though that is our goal um, as a as a land bank, in practice we haven't um, sent most of those properties for these types of uses, and so this legislation helps to um, codify all of the things that we originally aimed to do with the land bank and also um, gives, you know, a few more points for some of those things that are important, including the con community control component, um, including um, the permanently affordable um, component and also acts for, you know, what we would consider um, genuinely affordable housing if housing is going to be built. Um, at, while I understand, um, you know, that uh, much of the disposition policy allows for 120% of AMI, in reality, um, that's far beyond the reach um, of what most Philadelphia residents can afford. And so this is codifying some of the things that we already said were important to us um, with the, the, the structure of the land bank. I, let me just ask a quick question, uh, Council Member, back to Council Member Godier. I mean, have you worked with the land trust in a project in your district to, sh to sh see how that works? Because when, when you do that, that's exactly what you're doing already. H how many land trust projects do you have? I couldn't name um, off of the top of my head, but yes, we, we're working with several, especially um, community gardens in my district, um, trying to make sure that um, that they can be permanently um, on on the land that they're operating on and that they get um, ownership. Um, we're also working with groups that um, are pushing forward affordable housing projects. But if you would like an exhaustive list, I would have to get um, staff to put that I'm not, together. I'm not saying, I mean, since you have worked with them, you, you see how that works with the, the council person and, and the land trust because they're our partners. And I think we what we can do is help these land trusts and organizations partners with each other or partners with private developers to be able to better be able to do this. But it seems like my, my concern is then to, to be able to have this done you're saying we have to do it, but once it goes through the land bank and they have to prioritize that in there and they send it to us, it's almost impossible for us to say, no, nah, we're not going to introduce this resolution to, for them to hold it for one to five years. It makes it, it makes us contentious. So when, when the land trust or, or the nonprofits come to us with a project that they're interested in, we work with them and we know they're interested in it. They, they could, you know, put that property on hold give them an agreement for a, a little bit of time to see if they could get their finance, work with them, support their financing, whether it's tax credit dollars or whatever mm -hmm. else is necessary. Um, so 
I just don't, it seems like we're adding another step. We were trying to streamline processes to move properties out of control. Now we're going to add another step. I mean, this is the, my opinion. I don't know Thank enough you. about it. You know, there's been a lot of things going on, and I apologize for not diving in as deep as I should on this. But Thank I, I just so have much. so many questions on it. And so therefore, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm most likely going to exempt my district from this. And, Thank um, you. and, and, and it's, We've had a number of conversations on both, you know, the prior versions, the current version. Um, your concerns are noted. Um, I would just put out there that not only did we work with um, PCAC, a coalition of, um, you know, upwards of 70 community organizations that who find this important and would like to see more traction towards getting um, vacant land into um, community control and for community beneficial uses. We worked very closely with the administration to make sure the changes we were asking for were things that the administration could do um, and that would meet um, the mission of what we're trying to do. And I would ask, we have a number of, um, I understand your perspective and I thank you. We also have a number of witnesses that are here to talk about um, the fact that they do support this bill. And I would ask that we can move on in that regard. And I, and I, and I understand that and I, and I appreciate it. And I know there's, and listen, I think, you know, what gives us the ability to eventually you know, if this works well in your district and you, and you see how good it works in other districts, you know, we could we could then work with that. I there's just so much that that I need to understand uh, before that at that point. So I would uh, I no would listen to everybody who's testifying. I listen to uh, all these um, uh, people who are in support of this and understanding why. But they could tell you also that, you know, when they work in our district or at least in my district, that we're able to work together to do these already. So that that that's my only concern. So thank you, uh, um, sponsor of the bill, uh, Councilmember Godier, and and Mr. Chair for allowing my my comments. Thank you so much. I, th I think um, I think dialogue and discussion of of issues is an important way that we make better legislation. So thank you for your for your inputs. Um, do I note uh, Member Dom? Are you yes. interested? Chair yes, recognizes sir. Alan Dom. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning, everybody. And I guess my questions are for Ann Fadulin. I first want to just say that I agree with the goals of increasing more affordable housing in the city, but I want to be clear on what this bill will do to the process because I have some concerns, uh, especially hearing now that some of our district council people are wanting to opt out their districts. So what, my first question, Ann, is, is the executive director of the land bank. Angel Rodriguez, is he here today? No, he was no. not able to join today. Oh, he's the I'm executive. Here. I'm director. here representing. He is the executive director of the land bank that we have put in this Correct. position that has done a great job, and he's not here for this bill. Correct. Can you tell, tell me his position on this legislation? Uh, the, the testimony that I gave was was produced in cooperation with him. He's been in all the meetings that we've had with the councilwoman's office on this bill. And again, I think we're supportive of the intent of the bill, which is to provide a preference for affordable housing uh, in community gardens and open space. Um, you know, I do think Angel has concerns uh, about the operations of this and uh, the capacity of the land bank because, you know, when you're dealing with groups that maybe need to take a little bit more time uh, or, or maybe don't have as much capacity as some other groups, that takes a, additional staff time to get them through the process. And so I do think there's some concerns with the operational capacity. So I'm, I'm trying to be clear. Are you saying that the head of the land bank is in favor of this bill or not in favor of this bill? Uh, again, I don't want to speak for the head of the land bank, uh, but the, 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 he was consultant throughout the, consulted throughout the process, and he and I worked on, because I knew that he would not be available to testify this morning, he and I worked together on the testimony, uh, and I'm just going to leave it there. It is, it's suspicious to me that we have a bill and the head of the land bank isn't weighing in on it to hear his opinion, because I do put a lot of faith and trust in the head of the land bank. And so, As do I. You know, I think it's pretty imperative, though, that the person who administers this proposal be present to tell us how it impacts the community they serve. I mean, don't you think that is important? I do, and that's why he was included in, in all the meetings and conversations about this. 
Something doesn't sound right to me, but I'll, I'm going to let it go for now. But with that in mind, can you tell me whether or not community land trusts are excluded from the current process? They are not. Okay. And just so I'm, I'm, I'm clear, because I'm learning about this myself, I just want to make sure that the public understands the current process. So can you walk us through and describe how community land trusts can access land currently in the land bank? Sure, they would submit an application to the land bank for whichever properties they are interested in. Uh, and then um, they would qualify currently if they were doing 51% uh, or more of the housing development. If they're doing housing development, they would qualify currently uh, if they were doing 51% or more affordable at 120% of median below, they would qualify for non-competitive. Also, if they were submitting for a community garden uh, open space, they would also currently uh, uh, qualify for a non-competitive application. So they would submit the application. Uh, there's a time frame in which land bank staff has to uh, review that application. I believe it's up to 75 days. And then the land bank either makes a determination that the application is qualified and complete and provides a, uh, a lease agreement or a purchase development agreement. Because again, under current process, uh, you can uh, qualify for a lease up to, to five years. So either a purchase agreement or a lease agreement is then provided to the applicant. I believe they have 45 days to then sign that agreement and send it back. And once a land bank received that signed agreement, um, then it goes to the next land bank board meeting for review. Uh, if it successfully comes out of the, the land bank board meeting, then it's referred to uh, city council for introduction excuse me, introduction of the of the resolution to dispose of the properties. During that initial 75 days, there may be some back and forth between uh, the staff reviewing the application and the applicant, you know, to make technical corrections, to see if there's missing information, um, maybe to clarify something. Uh, so that goes back and forth. And that, But the goal is to have a signed agreement in place within 120 days of, of receiving an application. And what percentage, and this could be simple, you can give me quick answers on these. What percentage are deemed qualified applicants? Uh, I don't have that percentage in front of me, but I, I would say uh, probably that the bulk of applications that are rejected are because it's either an incomplete application or the applicant isn't qualified. And really to qualify, what you have to do is, um, you know, have no outstanding tax liab liability or, or violations with the city. Um, and, and oftentimes, sometimes that's difficult for folks to get, particularly if you're a new organization, um, the, you just might not have the records yet. Uh, so a, a large number kind of initially rejected, and then we try to work with with applicants to to get to the point where they meet thresh where they're considered qualified, and then we can go on to the um, you know additional more substantive information about what are you trying to do? Do you have the financing? What do your plans look like? I think what makes it a little bit difficult right now for um, some of these organizations that we're talking about with this legislation is that somebody who is able to have all the financing in place and have um, full plans and, and that kind of information right now has sort of a leg up uh, because they kind of meet more of the, the, the hard and fast requirements about getting your project done. Um, you know, but we do have mechanisms as we discussed before, a reservation letter or a license agreement to, to support that. But this, this legislation sort of makes that more, more prominent, I would say. And just again, give me a quick answer because we have a big hearing today. How long does it take currently to dispose of land in the land bank, depending on the process, the competitive versus the non-competitive? Um, so to actually get to settlement probably takes between a year and 18 months. That's because we don't settle until all the financing and permits are in place. And depending on the nature of the project that can sometimes take time you know if you get have to get a variance if something happens with your financing if your costs go up etc cetera, etc cetera. if you're looking at uh open space disposition so side yards aren't as complicated but again due to the nature of the applicant sometimes there's a lot of back and forth to get them to provide the needed documentation and get the signatures um and and so it really depends on how long it takes to get through 
usually the financing and permitting process. And, and you can give me uh, one one sentence answer on this next question. What do you think is the biggest uh, roadblock to creating more affordable housing units? Cost. Cost of building it? Cost of and, and securing the money. The limited resources, the, 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 the cost, you know, the, the high cost with limited resource availability. And isn't that going to be more challenging for us today than six months ago with building supply costs up, interest rates have doubled. I just think it's going to be a lot more challenging right now. Yeah, Based would, on that, how many of the CLTs would you think would meet the requisite financing qualifications necessary to apply for this land? Well, again, through this through this legislation, the the financing component is it gives them time to get that financing together, right? So I think today, if you had to if, if the CLTs had to show up at the land bank today and say, you know, what we want to do, and I'm making this up, uh, is is build 50 units of affordable housing. It's going to cost 15 million dollars, and here's our 15 million dollars. Almost nobody can do that today. Right. And what this does is, is allow them to have the time to be able to, to get that money together. Where's that money coming from? It comes from uh, city subsidy. It comes from uh, PHFA tax credit award. It comes from PHFA uh, fair money. It can come from federal home loan bank. Uh, it can come from a whole variety of sources. You know, I always tell people that do private development, if they saw the capital stack on one of these affordable housing developments, their heads would explode. <laughs> Because it's not easy and it's complicated. Very complicated. Many CLTs hopefully been successful so far to develop projects using land bank parcels. Uh, as as Councilman Squilla alluded to, uh, I believe the Community Justice Land Trust has done one in his district. I think they've also done one in the eighth district and the second district. Um, I believe they're testifying later, so they can probably give you the the full rundown. And then I know that ASE has a, um, a land trust project that they're working on right now. And I do believe that there's one, uh, I, and I, again, Councilman Gautier can correct me if I'm wrong on this one, that Mount Vernon uh, is pursuing in the third district. And then the other question I have is, and then I would, I just, one, one yeah. other thing that's not housing related, but then National Gardens Trust uh, is, is a big sort of land trust on the community garden front. I want to try to be as brief as possible in efforts of time here, but what I'm hearing, and it sounds like the qualified uh, community land trust can access the land now, but it's the unqualified entities uh, that cannot, that need some help here. Would this bill force the city into accepting applicants that wouldn't qualify under the current rules? I think this this would allow groups that, that um that are that do have capacity but may not have all the financing and everything in place yet it would give them time to get the financing in place to be able to compete on a more level playing field with in particularly well-financed private developers remember goody i see you breaking out in words would you like to give some input I just wanted to push back against the notion that this legislation was allowing for unqualified, would allow for unqualified groups um, to get land. We make the qualifications. The qualifications were not something that came down from high, right? We decide what the qualifications are. And this would tweak the qualifications to say um, that an organization that can demonstrate the capacity to undertake a project but may not have financing can have the time and space to get their financing um, together. The, the qualifications are something that are made by us. I will also point out that the organization would have to show that they have the money in the bank um, to ensure and maintain um, the property as well um, so that you know, to make sure that the property was in good condition until uh, the financing was put together. <clears throat> okay, uh, two more quick questions and I'll be done. Um, well, actually, in, as an aside, how long are we giving uh, CLTs timeframes for putting financing together? And that's one. And number two, uh, under this legislation, if a CLT cannot get the project done with current financing with the time they have, how does it go back to the land bank and do we start another round of another 60 days to allow preference to another CLT? How does that process work? Yeah, so um, a couple of things. Uh, currently, um, a CLT could come in and, and get a, a lease. Uh, 
you know, staff has the ability to authorize a lease up to one year. Any Anything beyond a year requires an act of council. Um, and then because it's a lease, if the lease terminates because, um, you know, the term expires or they're not able to meet the requirements of the lease, essentially the lease terminates and the property just becomes available again. Um, I would assume, uh, you know, we haven't been through this process yet. You know, we're talking about the legislation now, but let's say CLT1 um, puts together something, gets the property for a certain amount of time, um, you know, can't get to the point where they can fully develop it or de and, and acquire it fully, and they decide to give it back to the land bank, I would assume under this legislation that then if CLT2, I would think it probably is some sort of different type of CLT, then applies for it, that, that they would get that 60-day preference as well. Thanks. Um well, uh, and I just want to be clear for the record. Uh, I know Angel Rodriguez, head of land bank, is not here and is not weighed in on this committee hearing, which is I find hard to understand. Okay, I just, I'll leave it at that. But where do you stand on this? Uh, are you a yes or a no for this legislation? You know, I'm I'm a, I'm a yes. I have to say, uh, I wasn't very enthusiastic about this legislation in the initial form we saw it. Would have put a very uh, undue burden on the the land bank and staff with operations. There were these notice requirements. There were a lot of complicating things. Uh, honestly, I think probably about 90% of this legislation has been rewritten since we first saw it. I think we've streamlined it. Um, uh, that being said, I would not be surprised that we continue to work on on the operations of this. Uh, you know, should it pass out of committee and be pa passed in order to to further make sure that it doesn't uh, put undue burden on either the organizations applying or the staff. Um, but again, I do believe that it makes policy sense to provide a preference for affordable housing and um, and and a garden space. Would it make sense to pilot it in one district, see if it works, and let others opt in? Uh, you know, that's always an option. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you, Member Dom. Um, any other responses to some of those comments, Member Goodyear, in particular? No. One more question, then, Mr. Chair. Yeah, one more question. And it was just, I guess the, to either uh, Councilmember Goodyear or, or Anne Fadulin, Um if there's a, a side yard that's it's not competitive bid, it, this would not have to go through that process. So a side yard is still eligible for non-competitive. Right. Um, I, I would think if if we ended up getting a, a CLT application under this under this legislation, I think frankly we'd have a conversation with with the council person and and, and figure that out because I uh, I think. You know, we all understand what the side yard program is intended to do, which for those folks who may not be familiar is if you have a property uh, owner that, that has a, a it's an owner occupied structure and adjacent to either on the side or in the rear, there's a city owned lot and it's just that one lot. Essentially, you know, there is a very uh, proactive effort to get that homeowner to acquire that lot so they have some yard, yard space. It is deed restricted. They can't go out and sell it. They have to commit to using it for 30 years as a as a um, as a as a yard space, and and it also is does carry a, a 30 year mortgage. It's act, the actual right, but it would uh, not market be part, value. But, but what I'm saying, it won't be part of this because even though it's non competitive, right? It's it's direct sale. It's, it would be excluded from this process. Uh, I honestly can't tell you that 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 is the case uh, with the with the most recent version of the legislation, I, I would assume that there could be a, an amendment made to it that would, would that would clarify that that anybody who's applying for a side yard would not be subject to uh, to this this legislation. Member Squilla, thank you for that. that. Sorry, Mr. Chairman, so sorry. That's all right. Um, I think that needs to be clarified in the case of 55th and Poplar. There is a very a robust um, uh, lawn, vegetable, flower arrangement out there. And it comes sometimes in competition with development. So we need to kind of clarify who's on first, what's on second, so that we 
we, we were able to resolve it, but hypothetically, it could have been a line in the sand kind of thing. And so, so we might want to be a little clear about that particular provision. Member Goodyear? We'd be happy to make that clarification. Thank you so very much. Any other comments on this portion? Um, Council Member O has a question. Member O. Thank you very much, Chair. This is a question for Ann Fadolin. Um, can you uh, just simply say that this bill increases the opportunity, um, increases the um, the amount of affordable housing this city is going to see? That's what it does. Is that your testimony? Uh, my testimony is this would uh, has the potential to increase the level of more, I would say, uh, deeper affordable housing that we would see. I, I don't I don't know that we would see more affordable housing, but I do think this bill puts a preference for deeper affordable housing. What is deeper affordable housing? So rather than being affordable, let's say at 120 percent of median or 100 percent of median or 80, this bill, uh, I can't remember, frankly, the the latest language, and I'm sure the councilwoman would help me out here, but I think it really requires 50 percent of median. Uh, so that's what I mean by deeper. It's affordable to people who earn a, a lower more, income. More, more affordable for those with lower levels yes. of income, because currently that's not being done. It is being done, but currently the um, the the non-competitive for affordable housing is kind of wide open, where if you're doing 51% or more up to 120% of median, you would qualify, you would still do that, right? You could still qualify for that, but this sort of gives the folks that are generally applying under that non-competitive process are private developers that are well-resourced. And that's great, wonderful to have that public-private partnership. What this legislation does is sort of, if somebody's coming in under that affordable housing piece, is it gives preference to the application that's coming in to be more affordable for people at a lower income. So other than the preference, um, in other words, I, I, I would like your opinion, theory versus reality, other than theoretically, you know, more affordable, is anyone doing that? Are the it is the problem that that um, the land is not being made available in the district for deeper affordable housing, and therefore this bill will somewhat, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, correct or um, a problem that is currently existing in the districts. I think, look, it's hard to prove out because we haven't done it yet, right? But I do think the intent of this is, again, to level the playing field so that um, uh, developers who may be more resourced and are, are able to show up at the table with a full package more quickly than organizations that may not be as well resourced and have to take some time to get those resources, it sort of, it, it provides more of an even playing field so that folks are competing on a more equal level. Um, that to, that to I don't understand. So can you explain this to me? In other words, what does it matter that someone shows up with money and someone shows up without if they're going to build affordable housing? I understand the point where um, if you want to not provide that, pr that, that property unless it is um, going to be uh, either built at a lower cost or if it's built at a greater cost, at least offered for a to 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 people, you know, at, at, at a lower cost or lower fee, um, then I could I could understand, you know, uh, at least the, the 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 point that you're trying to make. But if, if someone shows up with money or they show up without money, someone needs more time. Um, if they show up with money and they're going to offer affordable housing, like my understanding is we are deeply behind in this city in providing affordable housing and we're trying to provide affordable housing. Does this speed that process along um, or does it um, basically provide a cushion for a nonprofit to try to get their act together to provide affordable housing? 
is it the same level of affordability or what you're saying is at a certain point in time, the private developers are not offering deep affordable housing, whereas the nonprofit or community land, uh, uh, land trust will work to get their financing, hang on to the property, and during that process, um, hopefully provide um, a greater level of affordability for a, 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 a group of people that has um, less um, uh, finances. Is, is that, in your opinion, Point really what the bill does? Point yes. of information. <laughs> um, I wanted to clarify the affordability levels for this path. The CLT path, which will only be in the non-competitive portion of the land disposition process. It will require, if um, an organization, a nonprofit, would like to do housing, it will require that rental housing be at 50% of AMI. It will require that home ownership be at 80% of AMI. The rest of the disposition policy, as I understand it, and Anne can, um, can correct me, um, allows for affordability to be... Um, uh, classified all the way up to 120% of AMI. Um, I know because I did a study of my district with the reinvestment fund about a year ago, the average third district resident is at 34% of AMI. That's a big gap between what would uh, be considered genuinely affordable. And so this path allows for um, a community controlled and community minded organization um, to apply um, and to get you know, some additional points, um, and we've included the rubric so that you can see those additional points um, for being community controlled and for pursuing um, that genuinely affordable housing. It also allows for them um, to have the ability um, to get enter into a long-term lease um, to put together their financing. And that's not about a nonprofit not having their act together. It's more so about this being a hot market where for-profit developers have a substantial leg up on community members that would like to develop um, community-minded projects. And so I just wanted to make that point. Okay, so, so um, on, on that point um, to Ann Fadolin, that is something that district council people cannot do already. They cannot say, listen, you know, I'm not going to I, I, I want more affordability, deeper affordability, but I'm just stuck. I have to give it to a commercial developer, private developer. They cannot do that. No, they, they can. They could, they could issue an RFP for a site specific and, and say that they want to get a certain level of affordability. Um, they could do it that way. Um, but through a non-competitive, I think this just, again, clarifies that if there were more than one non-competitive application for a same site that the preference uh, at the at the land management level right would be for uh, for the the community controlled entity that was providing the most affordable of and longest term affordable housing or uh, community garden access to food fresh food use would get uh, a, a sort of priority over an, an other type of application. Um, and frankly, uh, if you know that is the application, let's say the, the community land trust application under this um, legislation move forward through the land bank, and then the community uh, council member did not did not support that, and then there you know they could introduce a resolution or not. They as as I think was. Uh, uh, talked about at the beginning of this is nothing in this legislation changes the sort of, you know, charter requirement that, that any disposition or at least longer than one year requires an active city council. Uh, so again, it, it, it would be in the purview of the council person to, to say um, that they wanted to support this or not, which is frankly why we tell applications, applicants to go talk to your council member early on. Um, and we, uh, 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 but yeah, it, it, w it would still be at the discretion of the district, uh, of city council. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you so much, member. Do we have any other questions for this group? Seeing none, Ms. Williams, who's the next panel to testify on this bill? 
The next panel of witnesses are Mindy Watts, Ashley Allen, and Joyce Smith. In that order, can you tell me that you're on the call still, connected? Good morning, this is Mindy Watts. Hey, Ms. Watts, state your name for the record and begin your testimony, please. Sure. Um, my name is Mindy Watts. I am a principal at Interface Studio, which is a city planning firm based here in Philadelphia at 12th and Callow Hill. Thank you to the committee for hearing my testimony on Bill 220322 this morning. Since 2005, I've had the opportunity to work on citywide policy plans, including the original Land Bank Strategic Plan published in 2015 and the Land Bank's current Strategic Plan, which was published in 2019. I've also worked on many neighborhood plans developed along with community organizations and residents across Philadelphia, often in neighborhoods that have experienced decades of disinvestment, often apparent in the vacant lots and structures seen block to block. Vacant or surplus publicly owned land is a limited resource. It's a public asset with the potential to do an immense amount of good as it is brought back into productive use by and for communities. The current land bank strategic plan shows that the city owns more than 5,000 parcels of surplus vacant land. And as you know, the land bank's mission is to return that underutilized property to productive use. The land bank's disposition po policies spell out the types of land uses eligible to be sold or transferred either through a competitive sale in which entities bid on land or through a non-competitive sale in which people or entities apply for that land. The non-competitive sale option is available for specific land uses, among them side yards, community gardens, affordable mixed income and workforce housing, and community-based facilities. The problem is that the city's current process for making decisions about property dispositions through non-competitive sales does not provide any guidance for prioritizing what communities need most. There is no mechanism for taking into account what the local community says it needs. The current process also does not prioritize the depth of affordability offered by a given project. This means that a development proposing homes affordable to buyers earning up 120% of area median income or over $110,000 per year gets the same consideration as a development that would build homes affordable to households earning 50% of area median income or $48,000 per year. And in fact, there's a mismatch between the pricing of homes built that have been built on city land and the dollars that Philadelphia households can spend on housing. For example, between 2016 and 2020, only 7% of the homes built on city land were affordable to the most vulnerable families earning less than 30% of area median income or $31,000 per year, even though households in that income bracket make up 31%, nearly a third of the city's population. So we know that there are nearly twice as many low-income renter households in our city as the number of housing units that they can afford. Families are struggling to find and keep housing and, and to remain in the communities that they have always called home. So the language proposed in the bill under consideration today provides solutions to these challenges. It calls for a community-based plan for the reuse of surplus vacant land, a document that clearly states residents' values and needs. It calls for the city to prioritize projects that serve community needs over the long term by prioritizing dispositions to community land trusts who commit to providing deeper affordability permanent affordability, and community control of proposed developments. The bill allows for the time necessary for the community land trust to work with neighbors to come to consensus around the land's reuse, and it allows time for the community land trust to get financing for the project. And lastly, the bill calls on communities through community land trusts to make sure that public land will, serve, will support uses such as housing, growing space, and community serving businesses that remain stable and affordable for generations to come. Community land trusts are a tool that can help Philadelphia's communities remain intact and benefit from long overdue reinvestment rather than be priced out by it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we're gonna hold questions until the end of this panel. Ms. Williams, who's next? Ashley Allen. Ms. Allen, are you connected? Yes, I am. Very good. Will you please state your name for the record and please begin your testimony. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Ashley Allen and I'm the executive director of the Houston Community Land Trust. I would, uh, I'm, 
Okay, thank you. I am here today to give you examples of what it looks like when you prioritize CLTs um, with land bank partnership. We have been working with our with the Houston Land Bank um, now for approximately three years. The city of Houston has always been known as an affordable city, but recently due to an influx of new residents, along with the impact of natural disasters such as Hurricane Harvey, housing supply has greatly reduced and the need has greatly increased. And so the city of Houston, this current administration under Mayor Sylvester Turner has made house, affordable housing a priority for the city of Houston, but understanding that the traditional means of doing so would not work. So therefore, they decided to invest not only in the Houston Community Land Trust, but the Houston Land Bank as well as partners to ensure for permanent affordability of housing throughout the city of Houston. Through these partnerships, we've been able to secure over 104 of permanently affordable homes in the city of Houston over the last three years. What does affordability truly look like? That means we work with uh, buyers under 80% of the area median income, with our average home buyer being at 63% AMI. As previously mentioned in many of the previous testimonies, when we do not involve uh, tools such as the land bank and the community land trust to create permanent true affordability, um, for-profit developers will come in and usually aim for 120% AMI. But those are not, while there is need for that type of housing, the need for lower, um, for housing that can reach lower AMIs, again, that deep subsidy and that deep affordability is um, what we're aiming to do here in the city of Houston. And so we have been able to not only work with our land bank, but the land bank has prioritized builders who build at certain price points, capping it at, at currently at 212, and it will go up to approximately 240,000. What does that mean? That means that they can then dispose of properties and give priority to those who are building affordably, such as CDCs, Habitat for Humanity. Then the CLT is able to come in and partner with those organizations, and we do that. We've been able to create affordable housing, utilizing our land bank and the dis disposition of land to affordable builders. So I'm here today to really encourage um, city council to really um, think about the best way to utilize the land bank and land trust partnership. I understand that there are already mechanisms in place for the land bank and the CLT to operate, but the partnership between both organizations and funding and building capacity for both organizations not only creates a better return on investment into city funds to affordable housing, because with the land trust model, you're only having to invest one time because it's permanently affordable and keeping the affordability long term for generation after generation versus having to keep reinvesting into affordable housing without creating a net gain of affordable units. So currently we are 104 units up on affordable housing here in Houston in three years and currently are on track to have 400 affordable housing units by the end of 2024. So that is what can happen if you actually are able to utilize the partnership between a Houston community, a community land trust and a land bank and creating priority for the land trust. Because ultimately what you want is great use of city funds and long-term investment. And that is what you get with the community land trust because of the restricted resale price, because of the stewardship that the community land trust can provide. So therefore you're actually saving money in the long term by investing in community land trust and Houston uh, and land bank partnerships. So Houston is just one example, but Atlanta has also been able to do this with a um, land bank and CLT partnership. Um, other cities such as Chicago have also been able to do this. So you all would be in great company as far as being able to um, to really create that long term affordability, but you would also be um, setting a new path by actually putting policies in place to create that and put it in writing and to prioritize that um, the land trust in decisions about affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you so very much for your input and testimony. Every book I've read about um, from Seattle to here talking about gentrification and issues, some of the mistakes that were made by major cities is that they too freely gave up their publicly owned land to never get it back and to never be able to control it. And so we need to be a little more cautious and forward thinking as we look at the one-time utilization of this most important land asset. 
So thank you for your for your testimony. Who's next, Ms. Williams? Joyce Smith. Ms. Smith, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. All right. Okay, I can hear you. State your name for your for the record. Begin your testimony, and thank you for your patience. Thank you, Chair Jones, and the Public Property and Public Works Committee for this opportunity. And thank you, Councilwoman Jamie Gauthier, for authoring this important piece of legislation. My name is Joy Smith. I'm a resident of East Parkside and a, se a section of West Philadelphia located in the 3rd District. I've worked for many years at, as a consumer housing paralegal at Philadelphia Legal Assistance. I'm a member of the Philadelphia Coalition of Affordable Communities, and I serve as interim president on the board of, of Centennial Parkside CDC. East Parkside, like other Philadelphia neighborhoods, has experienced decades of disinvestment, redlining, and speculation. 72% of East Parkside res residents are renters, and the neighborhood's medium household income is at 14,000. We are seeing speculating investors snatching up and flipping land in our community. And at the same time, we're experiencing a high volume of RCO meetings. And developers are asking for variances to build units and houses that are unaffordable for most of our residents. Um, all of this activity is driving up prices in East Parkside. At community meetings, we often encounter developers who sidestep our questions about affordability to talk about their own economic hardship while they are getting land relatively cheaply in our community. Our longtime renters are, are feeling very vulnerable and scared of rent increases, and rightfully so. And the irony is that even working class folks with homeowner goals are being kicked out of East Parkside by speculating investors, or I'm sorry, locked out of East Parkside by speculating investors and developers. East Parkside's 50 year old community garden is illustrative of how community access to public land um, has benefits way beyond its intended use. Gardeners not only share their healthy harvest with other residents in a neighborhood food desert, but the Viola Garden is also about place making, creating a sense of wellness, promoting healthy diet, connecting and learning from others, and even building a stronger community. Our resident-led CDC has proposed an equitable, equitable development real estate strategy that aligns with our housing and home ownership object, objective um, because we see a really urgent need to carve out affordability and now. But our CDC, just like the residents, can't compete with well-connected, capital-rich developers, developers for land. As a longtime housing advocate, regurgitating these conditions is exasperating. There are scores of research on our housing crisis, such as Councilwoman Gauthier's housing study, 2020 housing study, and the 2022 Fair Housing Assessment Report. We need solutions and then actions. We need our city representatives to help level this field for their constituents. Okay. This legislation is proposing a solution. We ask this committee to take action and pass Bill 220322. Thank you again for this opportunity to hear how important this legislation is to our communities. And thank you, Councilwoman Jamie Gauthier, for introducing this legislation as well as the co-sponsors. Thank you. Well, Joyce, I almost, I asked Member Gaudier for you in East Parkside. She would not let me have it in redistricting, but I can, I can dream. All right. Um, who else do we have? Samantha Williams. The next panel of witnesses is Dominique Powell, John Davis, and Johnny Rashid. In that order, can you let me know that you are connected? Yes, I'm Dominique Howell, and I am connected, stating my Thank name. Thank you very much. Me. Can you state your name again for the record and begin Dominique, your testimony, please? Dominique Howell, PCAC member. Good morning. My name is Dominique Howell. I am an independent living specialist with Liberty Resources, the leading center for independent living for people with disability. I'm also a member of the Philadelphia Coalition for Affordable Communities. I'm not only an advocate for marginalized communities, but my most significant role is mine. I'm currently a resident of Winfield, Philadelphia. 
Born and raised in Northwest Philadelphia, well into adulthood, land justice has always been important to me because I have seen firsthand the negative effects that vacant land has in my community. Vacant land not only decreases property value, but it also takes away opportunities for the community of residents that need affordable, accessible housing. The supply does not match the demand in Philadelphia when it comes to affordable, accessible housing, but that all could change if we use the vacant land to build what is needed. Philadelphia's disabled population is 16% and growing. Most people with disabilities face housing security daily because of the cost of living and the lack of accessibility. Did you know that right now, one of every two renters and one of every three homeowners in our city is housing cost burden? Meaning once they pay for their housing, there's not enough left to feed and close their families. This story is one of my consumers who have faced This is one of the stories of my consumers who was faced with homelessness because her building was sold and the market, the market value increased. She was lucky enough to find rental assistance to be able to stay in the property, but is now faced with the burden of finding a roommate to help pay rent. My consumer is a senior and she should be able to move where rent is affordable and not be forced to live in a place she can't afford on her own. However, that's her only choice because otherwise she'd be homeless. This is why allowing community control is so important to further the affordability of Philadelphia housing. Since the vacant land affects the residents primarily, primarily the residents should be included in the decision as to what happens with the development of that land. Today, I am calling on city council to prioritize vacant land for affordability and community control. Give the choice back to the residents. Vote yes. Thank you to the city council and community members for listening to my testimony. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your input and thank you for your patience to wait to give it. Appreciate you. Thank you. Ms. Williams, who's next? Don Davis. Hello, I hope that I'm connected and I hope that you can hear me. Yes, I, can. I see you. I see you nodding. So I will go ahead with my testimony. Uh, thank you, Chairman Jones. My name is John Davis, and I've been working with Community Land Trust for over 40 years. I helped to create the CLT in my city in Burlington, Vermont, when Bernie Sanders was mayor. I then served for 10 years as the city's housing director. Since 1996, I've been part of a national consulting group that has aided over 100 CLTs across the country. So the first CLT was created in 1969 as an outgrowth of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. And there are now over 300 community land trusts across the United States. And they come in many varieties, but there are some features they all share. They are all nonprofit charitable organizations with a tax exemption from the IRS. They have governing boards where a majority of the seats are reserved for people who live, work, or worship in the neighborhoods served by the CLT. CLTs acquire parcels of land and hold on to the land forever with the intention of never reselling it, never returning the land to the market. They then construct or rehabilitate affordable housing on that land. And then some CLTs also support urban agriculture, vest pocket parks, or develop buildings for small businesses. But in all cases, the CLT then plays an active stewardship role in making sure that the housing or other uses remains affordable forever. Now, many city governments around the country have played a major role in starting new CLTs or in supporting the development of projects being done on a CLT's land. In my city, the CLT was initiated by the city government, but was established as an independent nonprofit. Uh, today, there are over 3,000 units of housing in our CLT's portfolio. It includes rental, cooperative housing, home ownership. So Burlington is not alone 
right? So city governments as diverse as Boston, Durham, Denver, LA, Seattle have also supported the development of CLTs in their cities. And then such support extends to working in partnership with uh, city land banks, as you heard from Dr. Ashley Allen. Um, Houston's not alone. There are also partnerships between community land trust and municipal land banks in Atlanta, in Columbus, Ohio, in Albany, New York. So why? You know, um, city officials support community land trust because they've grown weary of seeing public dollars, public lands, and tax abatements that were used to create affordably priced homes leak away into the market after a few years. The public investment is lost. The homes are lost. Community land trusts are a tool for plugging the hole in the leaky bucket. So if you adopt the measure before you, Philly would not be the first city to give support to CLTs, not even the first land bank. But I don't know of any other cases where a land bank's disposition policy has been has given an explicit preference to CLTs. So as Dr. Allen stated, you would be blazing a trail here. Other cities would look to you for guidance and inspiration. Thank you for your testimony. Um, and it's good to hear good things going on around the country on this issue. It is inspiring to Philadelphia. Um, Ms. Williams, who's next? Johnny Rashid. Mr. Rashid, are you connected? Yeah, I'm here and connected. Thank you. State your name for the record and please begin your testimony. I'm Johnny Rashid. I'm pastor for Circle of Hope, a network of churches in Philadelphia. I use he, him pronouns. I live in North Philadelphia, and I'm a pastor in Fishtown. I'm a member of the Philadelphia Coalition for Affordable Communities. Housing is a human right, and every Philadelphian deserves to live in a house they can afford, in a neighborhood they can thrive in. And it's a matter of human dignity that we do this, that we care for the least of these among us. And in my faith tradition, it's precisely what Jesus meant when he said to love our neighbor as ourself. So it's a matter of morality, it's a matter of principle, of decency, of brotherly love. And in my community, affordable housing would mean less displacement, more consistency, and longevity. It would mean green space and room for farms and gardens. It would offer more of a sense of community instead of the transients that my neighborhood often feels. I am one of three households on my block that has remained consistent over the decade I've lived there. We want more consistency, more neighborliness, and affordable housing and community land trusts help make this happen. We know that one in every five households in Philly earns $15,000 or less and can't afford to pay high rent or maintain high rent housing. And a family earning 15000 can afford a rent of 377 a month. Yet the average rent in our apartment for an apartment in our city is more than 1500 Even in subsidized developments that have low-income housing, most of the apartments or townhomes are only affordable for families who earn twice what you earn from minimum wage. So right now, one out of every two renters and one out of every three homeowners in our city is housing cost burdened, meaning once they pay for their housing, there's not enough left to feed and clothe their families. And this isn't just a problem in North Philly where I live. Where I work in Fishtown, a member of our congregation is consistently facing displacement because of an increase in rent. He's a disabled man who is in recovery and just finished community college at the age of 50. He's being responsible for his life, but he can't keep going if he doesn't have a place to be. This is basically what we're talking about. This legislation is for him and for thousands of other Philadelphians in the same position. We want city council to pass this legislation that will prioritize city-owned land for permanent affordability and community control and are asking for a yes vote on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor, for your contribution and um, testimony. Ms. Williams, who's next? 
Council member, at this time, we will need to take a brief break um, so that the IT team can connect um, the people we have registered for public comment. It is 12.03. We will reconnect at 12.10. We'll take a brief break. You don't have to disconnect. But we will take a brief pause.
Mr. Chair, we are now live. Thank you very much and welcome back. This is a continuation of the public hearing for the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. We are in the witness um, testimony portion of the hearing. Ms. Williams, who is the next witness to testify? The next witness is Mo Rushdie. Mr. Mo Rushdie, are you connected? Good Mr. afternoon. Mo Rushdie. My name. Good afternoon. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Thank you. My name is Mo Rushdie, and I serve as vice president of the Building Industry Association of Philadelphia. Uh, I am confused as I'm hearing that um, a number of district councils are exempting themselves from this bill. So um, I'm not sure why this isn't a third district bill. Um, I do also co-chair the BIA's Affordable Housing and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Committees and serve as the leadership uh, member of the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance. I want to thank Chairman Jones and the rest of the committee for allowing me to provide testimony today on bill number 220322. Council wants to build 30,000 affordable homes by 2028. And the private development community wants to help in significant ways because we recognize the need. This bill moves the city in the wrong direction, however, and will result in much less affordable housing being built that can happen without it. The goals of the community land trust are worthy, and we certainly understand council's desire to help and meet these goals. But this bill is not simply giving CLP, but this bill is not simply giving CLPs preference in land disposition. It gives them virtual a virtual veto power over any non-competitive land bank conveyance. The bill also gives CLPs sole discretion as to whether they want to try to develop parcel instead of a private developer or to delay for months the ability of any developer to move forward. When council created the land bank in 2013, thanks to the leadership of council member Sanchez, the development community had great hopes that finally all the bureaucracy in the red tape was at an end and the city would begin to release thousands of vacant parcels that has been holding. That didn't happen. In 2019, Council passed additional legislation intended to greatly streamline the process and we have seen significant progress as a result. So we're especially frustrated to see legislation being considered that will reverse that progress and create new considerable hurdles instead. I, for example, have applications for hundreds of affordable units that range between 60% AMI and 120% AMI which is $750 to $1,100 a month for single family home home ownership programs creating quarter million dollars worth of wealth for people in the neighborhoods. The land bank stated mission is to return vacant and underutilized publicly owned property to productive use and thereby to assist in revitalizing neighborhoods, creating socially and economically diverse communities and strengthening the city's tax base. The land, the land bank's mission is not, and I, again, I repeat, it is not to help struggling nonprofits become successful affordable housing developers. That might be a worthy second goal someday if the land bank primary goals are being met, but currently they most certainly are not. This bill and its sponsor are seeking a direct, question, a direct question. Does council believe that Philadelphia is facing a crisis due to a lack of affordable housing or a lack of community land trusts? I think we all know the answer. It is worth noting that currently there are a few community land trusts in existence in Philadelphia. They mean well, and BIA would love to partner with them to have the city's affordable housing crisis to help it. But these few CLTs should not be able to put the brakes on every future land disposition just because they have a worthy mission. The legislation would require the land bank to give a five-year lease for any parcel if a CLT requests it, regardless of its ability to build or if there is more a more feasible target proposed by a private developer, with, with, with the intent that the CLT would figure out later if it can actually build the project. The bill seems to imply it should not be held against CLTs if they cannot finance the project they propose to build. But again, our city is in crisis. Should we wait for the student to finish medical school or should we turn to the surgeon on hand to perform the surgery required? In the third district, there are 647 publicly owned parcels that can be used to house these in need. 647 properties. CLTs do not have the ability or capacity to develop a fraction of those. But I would like to propose to the sponsor an alternative to this legislation. Instead of creating new permanent preferences and hurdles, why not spend the summer identifying which of the 647 parcels that TLPs want to develop and then turn those over to them immediately. And after they, you have done so, you could immediately make all the remaining parcels available to any developer that can meet your affordable housing goals. I happen to be the chair of the Philadelphia Accelerator Fund 
which recently debuted to enable affordable home projects by primarily black and brown developers. In just a, in just a month, we are working on three applications of close to 200 affordable units to be developed on city land by for-profit black and brown developers. The bill now creates a mechanism that can chase them out of these projects and away from Philadelphia. In the BIA's blueprint, we argue that the city's housing crisis can be resolved if City Hall simply increases its capacity and disposes public land quickly to qualified applicants. There is no question that the private development community presents the best opportunity to generate significant quantities of affordable housing for its residents. Unfortunately, this bill is a dramatic example of City Hall trying to punish the development community for the shortfalls of its affordable housing policies. And before I end, I want to mention a few bullet points. The Housing Action Plan by City Council requires 3,000 or sees that there's a requirement of 3,000 to 5,000 homes per year of affordable housing to be produced. We are currently at 5 to 7% on that. The average person that bought 120% workforce housing home is $24 an hour. That's actually more like 72% AMI. These are facts. The PHFA rental marks 50% AMI one bedroom at $886. Two bedrooms at $1,063 and a three bedroom at $1,228. The for sale single family home at 80% AMI is cheaper than the 50% AMI rental values. My point here is these disposition policies is creating wealth for the communities and for the people in the neighborhoods. Please, let us take a step back and work together. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you so much for your testimony um, and your patience. Ms. Williams, who's next? Um, Council member, before we move on, um, we had instituted a time limit for all witnesses. Um, we were not able to hear the buzzer when it rang. Um, can we do a test, Modesto? Modesto? Could you hear the ringer? No, we could not. So I suggest we continue, try to work out our technical difficulties and uh, kind of do it by ear. Modesto, if you'd like, I can try to um, institute the timer. Um, just try to make sure we get to all the witnesses um, before we need to end. Um, Council Member Jones, I believe uh, Council Member Dom had a comment. Chair recognizes Council Member Dom. Chair, I'll be real brief. This is a question, I guess, for Mo Rushby. I just wanted to, and quick answers would be great. How many applications do you currently have in? Mr. Rushby, are you still connected? Mr. Yes. Rushby, are you I, still connected? I can, I can, yeah, yes, I can hear you. Councilman Don, thanks for the question. Uh, I have about a half a dozen to a dozen applications. What's the level of AMI? The level of AMI is somewhere between 60% to 120% AMI, in addition to the market rate homes. And that 60% AMI is ranging about $750 in total housing costs for a single family home for sale home to about $1,100 uh, for the same home for for sale. And that would be targeting people making between $17 an hour to about $25 an hour. Are you saying $750 a month to $1,100 a month? Yes, I am. Okay, it's reasonable. How long does it take, by the way, if we, if we said build a 20-unit job, how long will it take to get the financing and build it? We can get the financing done in 45 days, and we have recently built a project, an RFP, Workforce Housing, 16 units. It took us four months from A to Z to build it and deliver the units to the people of the community. Impressive. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank, thank you, member. Ms. Williams? The next witness is Ken Penn. 
Mr. Penn, are you available? Are you connected? Hello? Okay, the next Mr. witness, DeWad. Mr. Mr. Penn? Mr. Penn, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I can. Can you uh, state your name for the record and begin your testimony? My name is Ken Penn. Good morning, City Council Public Property Committee. Again, my name is Ken Penn. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. I'm the president of Benchmark Construction Group, a minority-owned real estate company located in South Philadelphia, as well as North Philadelphia. We are a developer, construction, and management company. Through my companies, we manage over 700 low-income housing tax credits and HUD units for nonprofit churches and community groups, which provides housing for seniors, low-income, and moderate-income individuals. We are also developers and builders of affordable housing in Hawthorne, South Philadelphia, North Philadelphia's Charlottesville community, Brewery Town, and what I call Greater North North Philadelphia. I am the president of the recently announced African American Real Estate Professionals, board member of the Building Industry Association, and chairman of the DEI committee. I am one of the first cohorts of the newly created Minority Development Program which was designed by PHDC to increase the number of minority developers in the city and decrease the shortage of affordable housing in our community. The Minority Development Program, as well as the Philadelphia Accelerator Program, were created to assist black and brown developers, technical skills in acquiring city land via the land bank and providing the necessary capital to develop vacant and underutilized city land solely for the purpose of providing affordable housing and stabilizing community and creating generational wealth. Bill number 22322 takes the city in the opposite direction. Community land trusts should not be able to beat out minority developers who are trying to provide affordable housing in their own neighborhoods. The city created these programs because it has historically not done enough to create affordable housing or to help black and brown developers. But now council is proposing that community land trusts are more important. Please do not pass this bill. We finally have a land bank that understands how to get cheap, vacant property in, in the hands of minority developers and will provide affordable housing for their neighbors. Let's let this process work. Thank you for your consider consideration. Um, and obviously, um, I'm opposed to this bill. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. Thank you for your testimony. Ms. Williams. Dawood Bay. Mr. Bay, are you connected? Can you hear me? Yes, I yes, can. Can you hear me? Yes, Thank we you. can. Thank you. State your name My for name the record. Dao... Yes, sir. My name is Dao Bay, and I am testifying. I'm sorry. My name is Dao Bay, and I am testifying today as a concerned member of the community and as a member of the Building Industry Association of Philadelphia. I want to thank Chairman Jones and the rest of this committee for allowing me to provide testimony on Bill Number 220322. I was raised in the Point Breeze area of the city. I have been surrounded by crime throughout my life, and I understand that access to clean, safe, and affordable housing is a way to help reduce gun violence. This is the way that people can get out of the cycle of poverty that they feel they have been stuck in. As a returning citizen, anti-gun violence activist, contractor, and growing, act, uh, growing real estate developer, I have seen the benefits of affordable housing projects provide to people in need. In, reg in regards to Bill 220322, I would like to appeal to this committee to postpone this vote with the idea, with, with the idea of working with myself and other qualified developers to see if we can bridge the gap between what each community needs are and what the right model that's scalable to meet the needs of the people. I would also like to appeal to this committee to look at the 647 lots that are within the third council matter district. A portion of these lots can be set aside for incubator tests to see if the qualified CLTs and community members can come up with an idea and bring it to market as a model for affordable housing. The bill in question does nothing but discovers developers like me from pursuing city properties and to develop affordable housing. We have a housing crisis that require all boots on the ground. We need CLTs, private sector investors, 
uh, CDCs and individuals to be enthusiastic about development of affordable housing. This bill is designed to give preference to some entities to get preferential treatment over applications of other. I question why can't we both work and both do our developments? Why can't a direct sale be made to these CLTs in the sponsored district? The city has an abundance of vacant properties for everyone, for nonprofits, for profits, CLTs, and so I see no purpose for this bill other than chasing qualified developers from producing affordable housing on the scale that this city needs. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your patience. Anthony Miles. Anthony Miles. Mr. Miles, are you con connected? Yes, I'm connected. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you state your Miles. name for the record? Anthony B. Miles. Please pre proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Anthony B. Miles. I'm one of four black principals of TPP Capital Holdings. Thank you, uh, Chairman Jones and the rest of the committee for allowing me to testify on bill number 220322. I was born and raised in North Philadelphia, and I have spent the last 16 years working to find solutions to do affordable housing at scale for black and brown neighborhoods. We have a pipeline of 26 affordable workforce, housing, and 132 senior housing units, 55 plus, on land we currently control. In addition, we have support to acquire 23 city-owned parcels to create an additional 88 affordable workforce and 63 senior housing units, 55 plus. This bill does nothing but give someone else a leg up while I work hard in my group to secure funding from entities like the Philadelphia Accelerator Fund and spend my resources on design and applications to make things happen for the benefit of Philadelphia residents who need affordable housing. I support a level playing field and so should you. Please do not support this bill. Thank you for your time. And thank you for your testimony. Thank you for your patience. Ms. Williams. Sarah Anton. Ms. Anton, are you available? Ms. Anton, are you Hi, connected? You, I am. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please state your name. All right, wonderful. What's your testimony? Sure. My name is Sarah Anton, and I represent Passion Square Civic Association, known as PSCA the registered community organization for the area addressed in Bill 220522 regarding the sale of 1100 Wharton Street, what is commonly understood in our neighborhood as the municipal complex. Since 2018, PSCA has worked with council members Mark Squilla, the Department of Public Property, the Philadelphia Industrial Development Corporation to gather community feedback for the proposed sale of 1100 Wharton. In previous testimony of the Rules Committee, we detailed the extensive community engagement process that PSCA assisted the council member with from 2018 to October 2021 that included multiple meetings um, and ongoing outreach and instructions on how community members could make their concerns known regarding this project. Uh, we can share a written copy of that testimony um, for your additional consideration if necessary. Um, since this testimony, we've continued to work with the council member and the community to explore additional areas and project details that need to be addressed. In February 2022, in response to concerns from neighbors, we helped the council member host an additional meeting with Altera Properties, the de proposed developer at this site. Following this meeting, Altera provided an updated traffic study, which we circulated to neighbors. And again, in response to neighbor concerns, Council Member Squilla paused the process for neighbors to further review the project and provide him with further feedback. In late June, he decided to move forward with the sale and asked PSC to, to inform the community. Um, on May 31st, the PSCA board voted to support legislation on the sale of 1100 Wharton, but we do so with, only, with the following four provisos, which reflect the very real concerns of our community that we heard consistently through our review process. One, that Altera continues its commitment to the final presented project details. In, in particular, the permanent affordable unit component with 16 affordable units 
Um, eight at 50 AMI, eight at 60 AMI, 12 affordable one bedroom units, six at 50 uh, percent AMI, six at 60 percent AMI, and six affordable two bedroom units, three at 50 percent AMI, three at 60 percent AMI. Two, that Altera commits to identifying a commercial tenant that will have a low impact on the treasured community space um, of Columbus Square Park, which reflects and respects both the character and pace of the neighborhood in this highly residential area. The design of the commercial space at the ground floor of 12th and Reed Street should have a street presence that complements Columbus Square Park and the surrounding walkable neighborhood. We firmly believe that buildings and uses surrounding a park are a key ingredient to a park's continued success as a public space. And we want to ensure that the new commercial space enhances and doesn't detract from the energy and liveliness that surrounds the day-to-day -day activities at Columbus Square Park. Um, secondly, we need Altera to commit to working with PSCA and neighbors as they suggested in their response to our letter in early May to identify a locally owned business as their primary tenant, not a no national chain store. A locally owned business as opposed to a national chain would benefit the local neighborhood by keeping money in the community and in the board's experience, locally based businesses are much more effective at collaboration and regular communication with community groups, neighbors, and park friends groups. Um, that Altera continues to work with the community to gain approval on a final traffic safety plan and a greening and forest plan. And finally, that Altera agrees that the final external building materials are consistent with those found in the surrounding built environment, i.e. stone or brick, in juxtaposition to the materials used at Altera's Lincoln Square development, which would not be in keeping with the architectural heritage of our neighborhood. Um, as mentioned, we outlined these concerns in a letter to Altera um, in early May, which we could provide for the record. We appreciate or encouraged by Altera's consideration and open response to addressing all of them, but there's still work to be done. And we appreciate Council Member Squilla and uh, Mark Cartella from Altera in their previous remarks acknowledging that, that this work is still uh, to be done. Um, and we look forward to working with them and to, with PIDC to find solutions to these final concerns as we continue the process. Um, we believe the unique and extensive level of community engagement in this process has allowed for continuing improvement to the proposed project and perhaps the addition of some components like the affordable housing component that might otherwise have never been included at the site. PSCA is proud to have done our part in this work. However, the resources and volunteer time involved to make this possible show a need for more city support as it acts on community engagement in the implementation of the 2035 plan. We hope this can be provided for ours and other neighborhoods. Thank you to the committee for the opportunity to offer this testimony. And I'm happy to answer questions about the process if needed. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you for your patience. Ms. Williams, do we have any others? Uh, yes, we have We have lots of other witnesses. Um, before I call the next witness, are you able to hear the alarm? Because the alarm was disregarded by the last witness. So the alarm is not being heard. We can't hear it. Okay. So you um, might want to, if we, we trust your timing to uh, interject when people have 30 seconds left. Okay. Um, all, right. all right. The next witness is Andrew Strober. Um, please adhere to the two minute time limit. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Andrew Stober. I'm a resident of the Passyunk Square neighborhood, a former board member of the Passyunk Civic Association. And I'm speaking today as a, a near neighbor of this property. And I want to urge the passage of Bill 20522. Uh, we've had a great collaboration with both the uh, with both the city administration and with Councilman School on this. And I really want to highlight the role that Councilman School played in empowering the Civic Association to advocate for a project that broadly reflects the concerns and values of the neighborhood, particularly the affordable housing component. As you heard in the last testimony, this project will have considerable amount of affordable housing. And while it doesn't meet all of the, the levels everyone would like to see or the depth of affordable housing that's needed in the city and, and the neighborhood, it represents a substantial step forward from any project we've ever seen before. What I also want to highlight here is that it represents a, a commitment on the part of the city to invest its equity, so to speak, in making sure that there are affordable housing and affordable housing and projects that's developed on city land 
both the affordable housing component and the new firehouse are the results of the city making a long-term investment in community amenities uh, rather than taking cash today. And it's an investment that I think we can all be certain will pay off in the long run for public safety, for uh, the many families that will live in that, um, in that housing for generations to come. So here's the passage of this bill. Thank you. Um, I think, do you think we'll even make it through those first two seconds Thank in an you. hour? I think it's going to take longer. We, we will not do, we will Thank do. you. Someone's, someone's uh, not on mute. Please put your phone and device on mute. Thank you. Ms. Williams, who do we have next? We have uh, Kimberly Lapno. Ms. Lapno, are you connected? Hello, good afternoon. Can folks hear me? Yes, we can. Please proceed with your Wonderful. testimony. State your name for the yes, record. Yes, and I thank, thank you so much. My name is Kimberly Lapno. I live two blocks from the... Um, I live two blocks from 1100 Wharton, otherwise known as the Municipal Complex, and I would urge the council to not pass 22052. Um, I have three points, and I will. I am timing myself. Um, my three points on the reasons that this should not be passed are as follows. I first and foremost question the validity of the land disposition process to date. That has really been more of a... Um, procurement process for the developer. It has overlooked key requirement compliance of the fleet service building repurposing, which was a centerpiece for the original PIDC proposal. Um, I acknowledge that with best intentions, um, our civic association um, tried to engage the community but has missed the target, leaving many neighbors unaware or those voicing opinions of opposition without a voice. And I'm part of a group that has submitted 600 local signatures to Councilman Squilla on our concerns. Um, we appreciate that the four provisos have been presented to Altera, and I have seen their response. So their response, paraphrased here, is we promise and we'll see. Um, and that is, um, frankly, uh, not uh, very much of a trust-inspiring um, trust answer. Um, the final thing I would draw attention to as far as my concerns and I think is motivation to um, ask that this bill not be passed is around the um, safety, uh, the impacts of safety and density um, were evaluated using outdated data from the 2035 plan. That plan has, I believe, six or eight years old. Now, our neighborhood has undergone tremendous changes. We have over 2,400 units that are currently being built within a four-block radius of this particular development. Um, we've also asked for a traffic study, which um, and can be presented for council's review. The traffic study states that there's no data available as of 2016, so no data was used, and that the methodology used is to ex um, the methodology to um, evaluate the safety of this. This development, which is surrounded by a city park, two schools, and heavy foot traffic from a very vibrant shopping commercial corridor, um, is a highway method that's appropriate for Bucks County, where the developers um, consultant is located. I would urge the council to take a step back and to look for uh, more authentic community engagement from a neutral convener, convener like the Planning Commission. I yield back and thank the council for their time. Thank you so much for your adherence to the bell that we actually heard. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Williams, who do we have next to testify? Adriana Abazetta. Ms. Abazetta, are you connected? Yes, hi. My name is Adriana Bisode. Uh, good morning, Council. Good afternoon, actually, at this point. Um, again, my name is Adriana Bisa. And since 2020, I have served as the Executive Director of the Kensington Corridor Trust, which is a neighborhood trust that aims to foster the equitable economic revitalization of the Kensington Avenue Commercial Corridor and the greater Kensington neighborhood through local partnerships, strategic programming, and an innovative approach to moving real estate assets out of the speculative private market. The Kensington Corridor Trust is also a member of the Philadelphia Coalition for Affordable Communities. My testimony today is in favor of Bill 220322. Philadelphia's Kensington neighborhood was once known as the workshop of the world, with booming manufacturing, lauded commercial success, and high employment. 
However, as manufacturing slowed and markets relocated, a once thriving commercial corridor became a hub for predatory businesses and services and illicit economic activity related to the drug trade and the opioid epidemic rose. Today, Kensington struggles to attract new businesses and build up value add businesses and services. Simultaneously, residents of Kensington are at risk of displacement due to rapid gentrification, as has happened in the neighboring communities of Fishtown and Port Richmond. Today, within the Kensington neighborhood, 50% of residents live below the federal poverty line. Unemployment is nearly five times the rate for Philadelphia overall. At the Kensington Corridor Trust, our programming is underpinned by strategic property acquisition, development, and activation, working to reverse trends that have left residents impoverished and stripped of a voice in their own neighborhood. Collective ownership creates a pathway for more affordable housing due to localized control over the housing stock. In addition, for many, for many historically disinvested Philadelphia neighborhoods, such as Kensington, it grants decision-making power to black and brown residents who have been excluded from these positions. The impacts of current day gentrification in the neighborhood demonstrate its importance as outside developers continue to construct housing in and attract businesses to the community that are unaffordable and unsuited for long-time residents. The proposed legislation created a would create a facilitated process for alternative ownership structures like community land trust, community investment trust, and neighborhood trust to acquire city-controlled property to a non-competitive process. We want council to pass the legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for adhering to the time constraints. The bell is working. Who's next, Ms. Williams? Chris. Martha? Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you state your name for the record? Yes, my name is Chris Spar. Please begin your testimony. Good afternoon, Chairman Jones and members of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. Like I said, my name is Chris Spar, and I am the Executive Director of the Centennial Parkside Community Development Corporation, who I'm representing in this testimony. In addition to my role at the Centennial Parkside CDC, I have a PhD in urban and regional planning, and I'm a certified urban planner. I also serve as an urban innovation fellow at Drexel University's Lindy Institute for Urban Innovation. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to testify in support of Bill 220322, and thank you to Councilmember Gaudier for authoring this important piece of legislation. The Centennial Parkside CDC serves the East Parkside neighborhood in the third district of West Philadelphia. We have a mission to preserve, promote, and revitalize East Parkside through partnerships with businesses and institutions and programs that engage residents, create opportunity, and grow a diverse, thriving community. East Parkside, like many of the city's neighborhoods, remains a racially segregated community, deeply isolated from the economic viability public investment, and cultural attention that other parts of the city often receive. Median household income remains at $14,055, and 57.5% of the population live below the poverty line. East Parkside is bracing for a new age of development. This presents both an opportunity and a challenge. How do we as a community development corporation work with a population that has long felt the pain of inequity while overseeing a development process that benefits this population by bringing the right mix of housing for residents to feel safe and build wealth. Within our neighborhood, which extends a mere 0.2 square miles, the city of Philadelphia owns approximately 16 parcels of vacant land. Over the years, we as a community-based organization have found the land bank process rather prohibitive and inconsistent to the point where at one time, we were given the advice that we would have an easier time overpaying for land on the private market. However, we refuse to give into this narrative and believe that the true path to wealth building and preservation of the culture and identity of East Parkside is through local control of land where the community has a definitive voice in the types of housing stock within our community. We have found the process uh, as it currently exists to allow a tremendous amount of financial benefit and value to be extracted from our communities by non-local investors and owners. Um, and for this reason, uh, we support Bill 220322 and I thank you for this opportunity to share my testimony. And thank you for your testimony. Um, and thank you for your patience. Ms. Williams, who is next? Lauren Gilchrist. Lauren Gilchrist. Ms. Gilchrist, are you connected? Hello, can, can you hear, hear me? You? Yes, ma'am. Wonderful. Good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Lauren Gilchrist, and I'm here to testify in opposition to Bill 220322 on behalf of the Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance. The Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance is a partnership of NAOP, the Commercial Real Estate Developers Association, Building Owners and Managers Association, Building Industry Association, and General Building Contractors Association. Thank you to the committee for allowing me to testify today. The Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance was formed to bring together the region's real estate industry and is dedicated to advancing inclusive growth, economic competitiveness and a predictable regulatory environment for development. Housing is a human right and too many in Philadelphia do not have sufficient housing. All stakeholders need to do more to solve this crisis and government must work with both the nonprofit and for-profit development communities to ensure that all solutions are being pursued. What cannot happen though is that one sector be given preference and priority over another. In the real estate industry we value speed and certainty and the development community will build what government needs if we can move quickly and have predictability from City Hall. In our business, land is a critical input, so the thousands of vacant lots that the city owns presents a huge opportunity to dramatically impact the affordable housing crisis if the city can put those publicly owned parcels into the hands of those who can build. The land bank was created with that intent in 2013, and in 2019, Council passed legislation to streamline the process further. This bill would reverse that progress. The city has more than enough vacant properties for for-profits, nonprofits, and community land trusts to work together to provide critically needed affordable housing. But while land is the most valuable commodity, financing is the most elusive component of development, and additional hurdles and preferences make it more difficult for any of us to get the financing we require to build the projects the city needs. The Philadelphia Real Estate Alliance supports leveling playing fields and acquired public land. The result will be an immediate impact on Philadelphia's affordable housing crisis. As a result, we cannot support Bill number 220322 and ask that it be held in committee. Thank you for your consideration. And thank you for your testimony. Ms. Williams. Mika Outlaw. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, please. Okay. State your okay. Name for the, I'm sorry. For the record, and begin right. your testimony. All right. Hi, my name is Mika Outlaw. I live in the Grace Ferry section of Philadelphia, which is under my Councilman Kenyatta Johnson. I work and teach at a Catholic school in Councilman Curtis Jones District, and my son goes to a school that was founded by Councilwoman Jen that is in Councilman Schooler's District. I am a parent, a teacher, and a member of the Philadelphia Coalition of Affordable Communities. For about two years, I was a NAC coordinator for Point Breeze and Grace Ferry, and it was my job to help people find resources for just about anything that they needed, but specifically if they were behind in taxes or their mortgage. More often than not, I received requests from people who needed help finding housing. I can tell you thousands of stories about people who find themselves homeless or couch surfing, or I could tell you about the moms group I'm in and how desperate these moms are for housing that they are going out to these racist counties like Johnstown to get housing for their families. And for some reason, the wait list is not long. For a long time, I have watched the city as they've given reward after reward to developers and higher income people moving into the city. But what about those who remain loyal to the city because it was home and they loved it? Even the houses that are being built for the price points of 190000 and 230 is still high for the average person. I make what will be considered a middle-class salary, and I am struggling. So imagine a person who earns minimum wage. We want City Council to pass legislation that will prioritize city-owned vacant land for permanent affordability and community control, and, and ask me for a yes vote for the legislation for the Bill 22322. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony and input. Okay. Ms. Williams, where are we at? LaDonna Butts. Ms. Butts, are you connected? Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm here. Okay. Good afternoon. Please state your name for the record and begin your testimony. My name is LaDonna Butts. I'm an advocate for WCRP as well as a community activist. I am a lifelong resident in the 19146 area code in Philadelphia. Today I'm here as a parent advocating for my child as well as the children in my community. The, for, the short version of why I'm here today has to do with my child who is a college graduate. She holds a dual bachelor and dual master degree. Yet she cannot afford to rent or okay. buy a home in a community that generations of our family have lived 
for more than 99 years. At the start of 2022, my child's salary was $36,500, and that's seven years after graduating from Villanova University. This salary breaks down to around $2,000 a month after taxes. The average cost to rent an apartment in Philadelphia is $1,666 a month. According to Go Bank Rate, using a 50-30-20 budgeting model to live comfortably in Philadelphia, you would need to earn $59,384, and that was back in 2016. Prices have continued to skyrocket since 2016, while salaries remain stagnant for many. So in light of the ever-present financial constraints of many long-term residents of Philadelphia, I ask that you, the members of the Committee of Public Property and Public Works, to vote yes on Bill 220322 and send it to council for a vote. I make this appeal so that my child can one day afford to live comfortably in the community where we were both raised and her grandparents were raised, both my father and my mother. Parents raised them in this same zip code. My name is LaDonna Butts. I thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Butts, for your testimony and congratulations on your daughter's graduation. And I think that this input um, is important because success means nothing without a place that you can afford to live and call your home. So thank you for your input. Ms. Williams, who do we have next? Rodney Whitmore. Mr. Whitmore, are you connected? Yes, I'm connected. How Can you doing? State your name for the record and begin your testimony. My name is Rodney Whitmore. Okay, thank you. My name is Rodney Whitmore. I am a resident of South Philadelphia. I work for Liberty Resources, a center for independent living. I'm an independent living specialist. I'm also a member of the Coalition for the Affordable Community. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Um, we have a lot of consumers that are stuck in nursing homes due to gun violence, and they can't get out because of the lack of affordable, accessible housing. We are asking a yes vote for this legislation. I work with a consumer who needs affordable, accessible housing. Consumer and her spouse rent a property for over 12 years. Consumer uses a wheelchair. The house that she lives in is not accessible, so the consumer has to be carried in and out of the home daily. The home has six steps to get in. It's a two-story home. So she sleeps in the dining room because she can't access to the second floor. Consumer completed many affordable, accessible housing applications and was added to a wait list and was told due to the housing shortage that she wouldn't know how long it would take for her to get housing. Consumer and her spouse both received SSI. The rent is $1,100 monthly. Um, but that's not including electric, gas, water, clothing, and food. Suddenly, consumer spouse was contracted with the COVID-19 and passed away. After the passing of her spouse, she fell behind on rent and utilities. Trying to maintain the rent by letting a family member move in with her. But when it came time to pay the rent, the family member moved out. She, re she received rental assistance for a few months but was forced to go into the shelter because, because she couldn't um, afford to pay the rent on her fixed income. We are currently trying to assist her with finding affordable, accessible housing. We really need to address the affordable, accessible housing crisis. Most of our consumers are low income and only receive $15,000 annually and can't afford the high rental housing. With more affordable, accessible housing, our consumers will have to, hold on, with more with living shelters, I'll be forced into nursing homes. With accessible housing, we have to wait on someone to pull us in and out of the house. We don't have to sleep in the dining room because we don't have access to the second floor. I'm sorry, I, I know I'm going over my time, but I'm trying to get this my point across. Um, 
access we need access for everyone with affordable housing we can we can treat ourselves out to dinner without worrying about being fifty dollars short on paying rent. We don't have to worry about the co-pays for our medications. With affordable, accessible housing, our cons- nursing home consumers will be able to transition back to the community and live independently in the services with services that they need. Free our peoples from these nursing homes. We want city council to pass legislation that will prioritize on vacant land for permanent affordability and community control, and we ask a yes vote for this legislation. I'm sorry that I went over, but uh, I had to get it out. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the insight to your client. Um, paycheck to paycheck, hand to mouth is a horrible way to exist, uh, and one that breeds tension um, and anxiety. So thank you for those those comments. Ms. Williams. Brad Forbes. Mr. Forbes. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, my name Please is Brad Forbes. Name. I live in Southwest Philadelphia. Um, I build community economy. I curate culture. I'm a ter- treasurer of a cooperative community land trust. Uh, and I'm vice president of a regional cooperative development organization. Uh, I can speak on this as an authority because I've been watching this up close and personal, uh, managing for hundreds of low-income individuals over the last decade. I can tell you that the crippling load of energy costs alone renders there essentially no such thing as affordable housing uh, for low-income Philadelphians. Uh, when I say that energy costs alone are doing it, are, are, are crippling, you know I'm telling the truth because uh, over 20% of Philadelphian households are making less than $1,500 a month. And $1,500 a month is the average rent in the city before even considering energy costs. So that means people can, uh, 20%, a fifth of the city could put every dollar they have and not even make the average rent. That's before utilities. It's a commentary on the disingenuous use of the AMI statistic, which includes high-income Philadelphia suburbs that does not represent the actual financial reality of Philadelphia proper. And so as a cooperative land trust owned and controlled by the people residing in it, my COT has been able to keep our community housed despite the economy failing uh, so many of us, even after COVID decimated our income streams it's during a time when private interests were filing for eviction at record levels. And you know, here they propose to become the solution to a housing crisis that they've only ever worsened. So community-controlled housing like my CLT has proven its impact in this ongoing housing crisis where the combination of profiteering speculators and disregard for human costs and superficial concern has clearly failed. The issue here is that community interests are not on a level playing field in a bidding war with profit-driven interests holding millions of dollars at the immediate disposal. We want city council to pass legislation that will prioritize city va- city-owned vacant land for permanent affordability and community control. We want to give our community the chance before selling their parts to private interests. We want the city council to be honest about the failure of private interests to serve the public needs. And we want a yes vote on this legislation. Thank you. Thank you for your input. That AMI, along with uh, surrounding counties, Montgomery, Bucks, and Delaware, puts us in Philadelphia at an unfair competitive price advantage for affordable housing. So thank you for that input. Um, Ms. Williams. That was our last witness. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you all. For your patience, Two, are you we will give. Say it again. So we um, we're going to give the witnesses a brief time to disconnect. We will be going into our public hearing. We will be ending our public meeting, going into our public. No, ending our public hearing, going into our public meeting. So thank you for all your, your testimony your witness testimony, and please um, feel free to listen. Modesto? Chairman, that is a Joy Harris. Her, 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 his, or her mic is not on mute. Okay. All right, so um, Ms. Williams, can you help uh, Modesto and let us proceed to the public meeting? Uh, yes, we should be ready. Um, you can um, you can go into the public meeting at this point. Okay, we are now in a public meeting.
for the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. Ms. Williams, will you please call the roll? And will the members here say a few words so that your image will appear on the screen? Council Member Dom. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm present. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Council Member Gauthier. Present. Council Member Gim. I am present. Council Member O. I'm present. Vice Chairman Squilla. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and colleagues present. I forgot what time it was. <laughs> and Chairman Jones. I am present. A quorum is uh, present. And I will now recognize Vice Chair Squilla for a motion on all bills uh, that were heard today. Council member, um, before there is a oh, motion before, on all Yes. Can we hear from the sponsors of the bills before we go into our voting? Ms. Uh, member Gordier. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to take a moment to um, talk to my colleagues and also to correct um, some misstatements that were made um, during the public comment. First, I'll say everyone here, I think, acknowledges that we are in an affordable housing crisis. Um, this is a situation um, that will take uh, pro you know, for-profit um, developers and nonprofit developers alongside our community um, to solve. Um, and the bill that, you know, we've put forward um, is just creating a path um, for nonprofits and community to be um, a, a bigger, um, somewhat bigger part of that process. Um, I would argue that if the for-profit development industry could do it alone, we wouldn't be where we are. Um, you know, it's going to take all stakeholders and for community groups to really participate in that process, um, they do need um, a more level playing field. Um, I want to correct some misstatements that were made uh, during the, the public comment as well. Um, this bill does nothing to change how the city is currently posting RFPs for minority developers um, on vacant lands. Um, this bill does not um, mandate that the land bank give five-year leases to community groups. Um, this bill doesn't um, reserve uh, automatic res automatically reserve land um, for community groups. And this bill does not change um, a district council member's ability to decide um, whether a project is um, worthy and if they would like to either create a long-term lease or dispose of the land. Um, you know, the uh, several of the commenters also um, suggested that the bill would provide um, an unfair uh, advantage to community organizations as it relates to um, disposition of city land. Um, that is also untrue. Um, For-profit developers have a huge competitive advantage as it um, relates to their ability to finance projects and uh, to their ability to get vacant land to do so. Um, this bill makes um, much more incremental um, changes than what has been um, described. Um, it gives um, points um, for community ownership. It gives points for um, permanent affordability. Um, and it creates um, a pathway that doesn't explicitly is, is ex exist now for groups that are trying to carry out that work. And I would ask for my colleagues to um, pass the bill with amendments out of committee. Um, and that would allow me to, and allow us to continue this conversation about how residents and community organizations um, can have a bigger place at the table as it relates to the land that um, really our residents own. Um, I'm willing to work on um, aspects, aspects of the bill that people um, find objectionable. I think that people were speaking of, you know, when they were objecting to a former version of the bill, I like the opportunity to make sure that everyone understands um, the amendments, understands everything that's being proposed, um, and, you know, then to determine whether we take it for, uh, forward for formal passage. And so thank you so much for the opportunity to say that. 
Thank you. Are there any other comments of members? Member Squilla? Thank you. Two things. I do want to uh, thank uh, Pashong Square Civic Association and the members of the community who were so involved in the in the project on the disposition for the sale of the property on the South Municipal Hub project. Uh, their work has, has been invaluable and I know it's been a, a lot of stress throughout these last four years and I uh, really wanted to send my appreciation to the community, uh, even the people who were, you know, had an opposition to it and the people who were supportive of it and all their input actually made this a better project. So I want to thank them for that. And I also want to thank Council Member Godier for her willingness to, to listen and, and go over uh, the concerns of, of this legislation um, and knowing that uh, we all believe uh, and want uh, more affordable housing in our in our city of Philadelphia. And I do believe that we can work together to get there. And, uh, the, you know, it's really important to have the community land trust, the land bank, and even private developers all combined working together to do that for all of us. So thank you for your uh, your willingness to uh, talk and, and keep compromising and working so that we could uh, continue to grow our affordable uh, market here in the city of Philadelphia. So thank you. Thank you, Member Squilla. And the best public policy comes after open, transparent debate about the issue. So I'm thankful for these dialogues today. Are there any other members of the committee that wish to comment at this point? Seeing uh, yes, Council Chair. Member O? Yes, Chair. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I also appreciate the work of council member Gaudier, very important issue um, in our city. We are far behind. Um, and uh, at least from my perspective, uh, I am concerned about what we just said, open and transparent. Um, to my knowledge, five districts um, have withdrawn from this bill. I don't know that that's the end of it. Um, and so it is not a citywide bill. Uh, and, and I don't think it's going to end up being um, applicable to a majority of the districts. Uh, what we, if that is true, uh, then what we end up is with a lot of uh, bureau bureaucratic regulation that actually does not increase the speed and viability of creating affordable housing. I think that's the thing. It, it will proceed um, to... Uh, in all likelihood to uh, a vote on the floor and there may be other amendments. But but at this time, I do think after careful consideration um, that unless it is something that um, uh, is going to actually create and speed along the process of affordable housing and, and deep affordability, um, <clears throat> it would have to be supported by uh, a, a majority of the district council members. Um, and regardless of what is being said, it is what is being done. They're withdrawing from this bill. And for that reason, I will vote no on the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Member O. Are there any other members to comment? Yes, Mr. Chair. Yes, um, Member Gim. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I want to acknowledge and thank the work of the sponsor. Um, Council Member Gautier on this important um, issue and for continuing to push on the creative and different efforts that Council is pursuing right now to build out an affordable housing agenda that I think she very clearly said will take literally all of us. It really does take um, our, our, our nonprofit communities, it takes city government, it takes, um, you know, certainly the mayor and city agencies, it takes private developers, and it takes a city council body. Um, we are in uncharted territory. We are at a stage in time when so much about the future is unknown, except for one thing, that we um, have to do more and we have to protect residents. And um, you cannot look at the uh, dramatic change in real estate assessments and simply leave it up to um, and not recognize the importance of having counters. It's not just raging about assessments, which some of our council members have raised uh, concerns about, but it is about understanding that we as a government body, as entities, um, do have a responsibility to uh, 
you know, to be able to respond to market forces, to be able to help with communities, um, and that this is an essential thing because otherwise we will be just at the mercy of a market that isn't for the majority of the people of the city. Um, and I do think that there is plenty of room for balance. I think that our the council sponsor has been an incredible champion for keeping um, things open and to being accessible. And I commit to doing the same um, as somebody who's listening and deeply uh, concerned and caring for this issue. Um, but Per council member O's comment that because a number of members may have removed themselves at the initial set, it doesn't mean that the bill doesn't chart a bold path forward. These are uncertain, unclear times. And um, sometimes uh, we have an opportunity through official action to have a number of our districts come together and figure out uh, a, a new path. And it is our responsibility to, to show our colleagues and to show the city that this is in fact in harmony with growth and equity and development of the city, both physical but also metaphorical as well, because it's got to be about people. You can't just build, um, you know, the physical infrastructure of a city and not have your people grow along with it. So, um, you know, I am in support of moving the bill out of committee and I want the testifiers and witnesses and people who took the time to do public comment to understand that we are committed to a process that works, um, not, you know, a process for the sake of moving something through, but something that is different about what we're doing right now. We cannot continue to do the same things. Um, we need to partner up with different entities. And I think some of the suggestions made by many of the witnesses and testifiers are really, really important for us to consider moving forward. And I will certainly take that um, into consideration um, as I vote in support of this bill. Uh, but I just wanted to um, thank Council Member Gautier for being open and willing to listen to be a partner in this process and to know that this is the first step of a lot of pieces of work that need to come together. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Member Gim. So are there any other comments at this point? Hearing yes. none. Yes. Member Jones? Yes, yes. Member yes. Dom? Thank you, thank you, Chair Jones. I just wanted to reiterate, I'm the, I'm in favor of this affordable housing and making sure we do as many units as possible across the board. It is this process that is a concern of mine. And we don't, none of us know if this is going to work or not. It's really a test, okay? We don't know. It's a test. And in many ways, I may have said this earlier, maybe this should just be a pilot in one district and see if it works with the opportunity of other district council members to opt in if it does work. But I think to do it across the board or even in half of the districts is could be could be problematic you would never go into a new venture across the board you would always test it out or pilot it and it's not only half half the districts have opted out it's 75 percent of the land in the land bank has opted out that's in those districts and then with, with a lack of the head of the land bank not being here and giving his comments it's a big concern to me i, I don't understand why that's happening and, and because of that i would like this bill separated from the other bills because i will be voting no I am in favor of the goal. I just want to put that on the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Duly noted, Member Don. Ms. Uh, Member Goodyear, would you like to respond at all? You, you don't have to. But if you'd like to, feel free. Okay. You, are you, you know you're on mute? Yes, I thought me shaking my head um, communicated no. <laughs> okay. No, it's fine. All right. So if there are no other comments, we will separate out uh, bill number 220322. Um, I'm going to call on uh, Vice Chair Squilla for a motion on bill number 220322. Well, I think first we're going to call for an amendment. Yes. Uh, right. Okay. Yes, correct. All right, Mr. Chair, I offer an amendment to bill number 220322. A copy of the amendment has been circulated to all members of the committee. I move for the adoption of the amendment. Is there a second? 
Second. second. Uh, member uh, Oath, uh, for the record, second the bill. It has been properly moved and seconded that uh, bill number 222 and its amendment be approved. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, and um, we will now. Yeah, now move the bill as amended. As amended. With the other bills, or are we. No, we no let's move that separately. Okay, so um, that's bill number two two zero three two two. All right, the other bills that were uh, heard from today will be uh, combined, and I'm looking for a motion from my vice chair, Member Squilla, on those bills. All right, we're going to move out um, as amended. We're going to move. I move the bill number two two zero three two two as amended, be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended as to permit the first reading of these bills at the next session of council. Second. It is seconded by member O um, that the aforementioned bills be uh, no, Just the one bill. Just the one bill. Okay. Be two, moved two, out zero, of council. Three, two, two. That is three, um, two, two. The, la the community Got land it. trust bill. Let me repeat but it. It has been moved and properly seconded that the amended bill um, be moved out of committee with a favorable recommendation and that the rules of council be suspended to an outlet's reading at our next session in council. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All, all those opposed? Nay. Uh, there's one nay. Nay. Uh, two. two nays, and that is member O, and who else? Member Dom. And member Dom. So I think the eyes have it. Let me let me do a roll yes. call. Let's do a roll call. I'll do the roll call if you want, Council Member. Thank you, Member. I mean, thank you, Miss Williams. Okay, Council Member Dom. Aye. Council Member Gautier. Aye. Council Member Gim. Aye. Council Member O. Nay. Council Member Squilla. Aye. Council Member Jones. Aye. The ayes have it. What's the, call? What's the count? Uh, the ayes have it four to two. So the uh, bill is amended and approved, voted out of council. Um, thank you very much, Nick. I look to Vice Chair Squilla for a motion on the rest of the bills on the, today's calendar. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the bills number 220496, 220521, 220524, 220525, and 220522, and two, uh, that's it. So it's 220496, 220521, 220524, and 220525. Be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move the rules of council be suspended as to permit the uh, first reading of these bills at the next session of council. Second. Is there a sec it has been moved and properly seconded. Uh, for the record, Councilman O seconded it. Um, all those in favor of the aforementioned bills signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes have it. Uh, and the aforementioned bills are approved and moved from this council with a favorable recommendation and rule suspension. Council um, members, um, I think we did miss one bill, one more bill, 220522. Um, yes, we did. Yes, okay. we did. I'm, so I'm I calling on my vice chair to uh, make that right with a motion for the bill. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I move the, the bill number 220522 be reported from this committee with a favorable recommendation and further move that the rules of council be suspended to submit the first reading of these bills at this bill at the next session of council. Is there a second? Second. Is there seconded by member O? Second. It, is, it has been moved and properly seconded. All those in favor of moving this bill with a favorable recommendation of our committee signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed? The ayes has it. So um, are there any other comments on today's hearing? Um, I would like to add for the record, this was my first chairmanship of the Public Property Committee and Public Works. 
Thank you for your attendance. It was a doozy. Um, and this concludes the business of the Committee on Public Property and Public Works. Um, thank you all for your participation and cooperation. Thank you, Mr. Good job. Thank, thank you, Samantha. You. Good job, Sam. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. All right. Bye. 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 Bye.